Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Mark Levine, chair of the City Council's Committee on Health. Pleased that we're joined by fellow Health Committee member, Dr. Matthew Eugene, council member from Brooklyn, as well as Health Committee member, council member Alika Ampri Samuel, and others will be joining us as well. We have three or four simultaneous hearings going on right now, so it's a busy day around City Hall. Today we're going to be hearing four bills aimed at protecting children and all New Yorkers from excessive consumption of sugar. Introduction 5, sponsored by Councilmember Barron, requires signage about the risks of sugars and other carbohydrates for people with diabetes and prediabetes. Proposed introduction 1064, sponsored by Councilmember Kalos, would prohibit chain restaurants from offering sugary sodas as default menu items in meals aimed at children. Introduction 1326, which I'm pleased to be the lead sponsor of, requires notification of significant amounts of added sugar on menu boards in chain restaurants. And introduction 1361, which I'm also sponsoring, requires the Department of Health to report on the occurrence of diabetes and diabetes-related complications and to develop a plan to reduce such health problems. New York City is losing the fight against obesity and type 2 diabetes, and sugar is largely to blame. According to DOHMH, 34% of city adults are overweight, and another 22% are categorized even more problematically as obese. And tragically, this crisis is affecting children as well, starting at extremely young ages. One in five kindergartners and one in four Head Start children are obese in New York City. The statistics on type 2 diabetes are similarly alarming, with an estimated 987,000 New Yorkers now afflicted with this disease, many without knowledge of their condition. And there is a disproportionate impact among African American, Latino, and Asian New Yorkers who are, average, who are on average twice as likely as white New Yorkers to have type 2 diabetes. We need to give New Yorkers every tool we can to help them win the battle against obesity and diabetes. And there is no tool more powerful than information. Unfortunately, when it comes to the food we eat in this city, critical information is often lacking. A quick look at a typical fast food menu, menu makes it clear. New Yorkers are being served items that they would have no reasonable expectation of knowing are packed with added sugar. I'm not talking about desserts, which everyone knows have a lot of sugar. I'm talking about items like the following. These are actual menu items at chain restaurants in New York City. A salad with 40 grams of added sugar. That's equivalent to 10 teaspoons of added sugar. A side order of baked beans with 18 grams of added sugar. That's like four and a half teaspoons added into an order of baked beans. A honey barbecue sandwich with 21 grams of added sugar. A family-sized macaroni salad with 30 grams of added sugar. A small barbecue Hawaiian pizza, 33 grams of added sugar. An individual order of oatmeal, 33 grams of added sugar. I could go on and on and on, but it is clear that New Yorkers are ordering menu items which they should have no reasonable expectation are packed with what in some cases is more than the entire recommended maximum consumption of sugar in one single menu item. New Yorkers need to be warned of the excessive amounts of sugar being added to food they are eating. That's why our bill, 
intro 1326 would require an icon to appear on menu items in chain restaurants, warning of high amounts of added sugar. This bill builds on the successful implementation of calorie counts and sodium warnings on New York City menus, which are already providing critical and valued information to New Yorkers. If we are going to win the fight against obesity and type 2 diabetes, we need to empower New Yorkers with the knowledge to make better, smarter, and healthier eating choices. This package of bills will go a long way towards achieving that goal. We look forward to hearing from the Department of Health and from advocates and health experts on how we can partner together in this fight. I am pleased that we have been joined by the lead sponsor of Intro 1064, our colleague Councilmember Ben Kalos, and I'm going to turn it over to him for opening remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. I want to thank all of the parents, advocates. I see children in the audience, and I think that's absolutely amazing. Uh, students and members of the media who are here and watching online. Thank you to our speaker, Corey Johnson, and to our Health Committee Chair, Mark Levine, for working to get this bill heard. And thank you to the Council staff for your hard work to ensure this bill reflects the voices and expertise of parents and advocates for the Healthy Happy Meals legislation. The CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, estimate that one in five school-aged children and young people six to 19 years is obese. According to the New York City Department of Health, half of elementary school children are overweight, with one-fifth of kindergarten students and one-fourth of Head Start students obese. Obese children and adolescents are more likely to become obese adults, and even young children can develop chronic health conditions and diseases, including asthma, sleep apnea, bone, bone and joint problems, type 2 diabetes, and risk factors for heart disease. The American Heart Association recommends that children over the age of two have no more than one eight-ounce sugary drink a week, yet the AHE also reports that children today are consuming as much as 10 times that amount. Introduction 1064 of 2018 can help reverse these trends by requiring restaurants to make healthy drinks like nonfat milk and water the norm on children's menu. Intro 1064 of 2018 ensures that water, milk, 100% fruit juice, and flavored water without added sweeteners are preferred options for all restaurant kids' meals offered in New York City. Uh, this would be across every single restaurant. A 2017 Global Strategy Group survey commissioned by the American Heart Association found that New Yorkers expressed nearly universal support at 94% for making the food and beverage option in children's menus healthier. The survey concluded that New York City voters are strongly in favor at 87% of making healthy drinks like water and low-fat milk the default drink option on children's menu. This bill would also hold non-compliant restaurants accountable. Any restaurant that violates any of the provisions of this bill would be held liable for penalties between 200 and 500 for the first violation, 500 and 1,000 for the second violation within any 12-month period, and 1,000 to 2,500 for a third or subsequent violation within any 12-month period. A version of this legislation was in originally introduced in 2011 by former council member and current state senator Leroy Comrie. Uh, it was something that I later reintroduced with uh, co-sponsorship by Councilmember, now Speaker Corey Johnson, and Councilmember Steve Levin. Uh, it shouldn't need to take eight years uh, to move public health to where we are today, uh, but we're committed, and we're going to keep going and continue to ensure that we have access to healthy food. I'd like to thank our uh, chair, council members Espinal, Ayala, Rose, Reynoso, Rosenthal, Richards, and Rivera for co sponsoring this current version of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, council member Kalos. And we're now going to turn it over to representatives of the administration. Uh, it's uh, Commissioner Kessler and uh, Assistant Commissioner and uh, Director Shea. You, you can give us your proper titles. We will ask you to do the affirmation with our committee counsel, Sarah Liss. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. 
please. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chair Levine and members of the committee. I am Kim Kessler, Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Chronic Disease Prevention and Tobacco Control at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and I'm joined by my colleague Sarah Shi, Assistant Commissioner of the Primary Care Information Project. On behalf of Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the proposed legislation, which would require healthy drink options for children's meals, create a warning for food in restaurants that are high in added sugar, <coughs> require restaurants to post signage about the risks of sugars and other carbohydrates, and require the department to report data about New Yorkers with diabetes. The mission of the health department is to improve and protect the health of all New York City residents and promote health equity. Obesity and other diet-related diseases, including type 2 diabetes and heart disease, are significant health problems in New York City and disproportionately affect black, Latino, and poor New Yorkers. New York City has implemented numerous programs, policies, and initiatives to improve the health of New Yorkers, <coughs> yet unacceptable inequities, avoidable and unjust differences in health outcomes remain. In New York City in 2017, over 34% of black adults and 33% of Latino adults had obesity, compared to 19% of white adults. 15% of black adults and 16% of Latino adults had diabetes, compared to 7% of white adults. And diabetes rates are increasing in New York City and across the country. Since 2002, adult prevalence of diabetes in New York City has increased by over 40%. Continued efforts to address these chronic conditions are needed, and pursuing these efforts is a top priority for the department. Diet is a key risk factor for poor health outcomes, yet New Yorkers face a difficult environment when trying to make healthy choices. Foods high in salt and sugar are widely available, heavily promoted, and often offered in large portions. In the face of this landscape, we have many strategies to increase availability, access, and awareness of healthy food, promote active living, and decrease consumption of foods high in salt and sugar. For example, in 2017, we distributed over $1 million worth of fruit and vegetables via Health Bucks, helping to put fresh, locally grown produce into the hands of thousands of low-income New Yorkers. The Health Department also provides nutrition education in many settings across the city, including child care centers, through programs like Eat Well, Play Hard, which alone has reached over 85,000 children, parents, and staff since its inception in 2008. We have also produced media campaigns that call attention to the aggressive marketing practices of the food industry, highlight the importance of family support in milk making healthy lifestyle changes, and urge New Yorkers to make healthy choices like avoiding sugary drinks and choosing fruits and vegetables more often. The department's strategies are aimed at addressing multiple aspects of the food system, from production to consumption, with initiatives that target food industry practices as well as individual behaviors. The department's actions that reduce the prevalence and impact of diabetes are similarly comprehensive. We focus on prevention and address diabetes, obesity, and related chronic disease at many stages, from baby-friendly hospitals and breastfeeding empowerment programs to nutrition standards in community and faith-based organizations, child care centers, and public schools to discourage the consumption of sugary drinks across the population. We also work with both clinical and community-based partners to increase the availability of the National Diabetes Prevention Program, or NDPP, in the neighborhoods with high rates of obesity and chronic disease in the city. The Health Department has added over 140 NDPP workshops over the past four years, focusing on communities with the worst public health outcomes. Reducing consumption of sugary drinks is a top priority of the Department and relevant to the bills we are discussing today. Not only are sugary drinks heavily marketed to youth, low-income neighborhoods, and communities of color, they are also linked to serious health risks, including weight gain, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes. Actions that reduce sugary drink consumption also create opportunities to address racial and ethnic health inequities in these diet-related diseases. I thank the Council for recognizing these issues and Chair Levine and Council Members Kalos, Espinal, Ayala, Rose, and Barron for sponsoring these pieces of legislation. I would now like to turn to the bills under consideration today. Intro 1064A would remove sugary drinks as the default beverage for children's meals offered at certain food establishments. Improving beverage options in children's meals is important, and we always recommend water and unflavored, unsweetened milk or milk alternatives as the best beverage options for your health. The administration supports this bill. This will shift norms about these beverages and, create, and creates opportunities that re to reduce sugary drink consumption among youth. This is especially important since just one sugary drink serving can contain more calories from added sugars than a child's recommended daily limit. Of note, sugary drink consumption is especially concerning in our youngest New Yorkers. In 2015, 
Nearly a quarter of New York City children ages 0 to 5 consumed one or more sugary drinks daily, and within the same age range, black and Latino children were significantly more likely to drink sugary drinks daily than white children. These differences in consumption are mirrored in our adult populations, and they demonstrate that it is never too early to send a strong messages about the importance of avoiding sugary drinks. We would like to propose some edits for enforcement purposes and recommend limiting flavored milk to 130 calories, which aligns with the New York City food standards. We look forward to working with Council to make this important change in the food environment for children. Intro 1326 would require certain food service establishments to post a warning label and icon for menu items that contain more than 12 grams of added sugars. We thank the Council for raising this important topic and highlighting the impact that added sugars can have on our health. Sugary drinks are the largest single source of added sugars in our diets, and nearly half of added sugar consumed by children and teens comes from these beverages. We look forward to speaking further with Council about the feasibility of implementing this policy. Intro 5 would require certain food service establishments to display an informational poster about the risks of excessive sugar and other carbohydrate intake for diabetic and pre-diabetic individuals. We appreciate the intent of this bill to address this disease on a population level by providing information to consumers, and we agree that restaurants are an important place for approaches to address public health, including through health warnings. For people living with diabetes and prediabetes, diet is a key component of the individualized care plan. However, because there is no one-size-fits-all dietary recommendation for all people with diabetes and prediabetes, crafting a poster that provides sufficiently tailored information on a complex topic could present challenges. We also note that experts recommend that nutrition labels be simple and easy to understand, requiring no specific or sophisticated nutritional knowledge. However, the proposed signage may not provide actionable information to consumers as it does not link health messaging to specific menu items. We look forward to discussing this bill further. Intro 1361 would require the department to report on a variety of diabetes-related health problems, disaggregated by various demographics and issue recommendations for reducing the public health impact of diabetes. The administration supports this bill. We understand the importance of being able to track progress in order to understand the factors associated with these complications and develop policies and programs to move the needle in the right direction. The department has access to a variety of data sources, including our own robust A1C registry, vital statistics data, and community health survey results, as well as the State Health Department's Statewide Planning and Research Cooperative System, or SPARCS, data set, and the United States Renal Data System. While the available data does not cover all of the indicators requested in the bill, we look forward to working with Council to develop a report based on available data that provides a comprehensive picture of diabetes and its health impacts in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. We are happy to answer questions. Thank you both. I want to focus on the alarming trends that you mentioned. I just want to get the stats out there. What is the current rate of overweight and obesity in New York, and can you uh, describe the trend on that factor? Um, current rates of overweight and obesity, I think that you included in your opening statement. For adults, it's a near two-thirds of the population that are overweight and obese, and for kids, as you indicated, it's about a one in five among our K-8 to population. How does that compare to uh, past years? Uh, we've had, we haven't made the progress that we'd like to have made in addressing this, this factor. Um, so obesity rates have uh, been relatively steady in New York City in the past several years, but not going down. Diabetes, uh, what is the rate? Diabetes rate citywide is a little over 11%, I believe, um, with, with vast disparities in different communities. Uh, I definitely want to focus on the disparities, but just to get the trends down, over the global trends. So. Diabetes is also plateaued, or is it actually getting worse? Diabetes rates have been going up. Is that correct, sir? Yes, they have. Yes, diabetes um, had an experienced an increase from 2002 from 8% to current, um, and it's, um, it continues to increase steadily. So amidst all of the public policy interventions, all the advances in science that has helped us understand the components of healthy diet, all the public uh, information campaigns that we've done in this city, uh, how is it that we are stalled on obesity and sliding backwards on diabetes? 
Thank you for that question. I, I agree with the, um, your characterization of this as something to be extremely concerned about. The rates, even where we've seen uh, rates steady off as opposed to increase, they're certainly far too high despite the efforts that we've had at the local level and efforts that have been happening nationally and state, statewide as well in terms of awareness of this issue. Uh, obesity is a complicated um, issue. It's we're really we are up, New Yorkers are up against a lot when they're trying to make healthy choices in the city. It has to do with the food environments that we're all trying to navigate and other uh, and other um, factors that contribute to this. Um, it would be challenging to see changes in obesity rates over time because it is difficult uh, for people to reverse obesity once they have obesity, uh, which doesn't mean that we can't see progress in other areas. Right, but the continual emergence of obesity at young ages means that we're, we're in the midst of some sort of ongoing failure. This isn't only a legacy of, of people who, who uh, have suffered from obesity for years and have challenges overcoming it. There are additional people, young people, the most vulnerable, the most innocent, you could say. Uh, and it, it's just, it's enormously frustrating and worrying because of how far we've come in understanding the ways that diet and exercise contribute to these diseases and the work that we have attempted to, to spread that information, uh, I think it, this gets beyond the scope of this hearing in some ways, but I think it re probably reflects a fail failure of, of curriculum in the public school system to help teach people what is healthy eating. Um, it, it probably reflects failures in the diet that were, and, and the meals that we're providing in schools. Again, this is beyond the scope of the hearing, but uh, it, it's extremely worrisome to me. Um, and, and a source of yet additional uh, frustration are disparities in these diseases along lines of uh, race, ethnicity, and income. Uh, could you say anything about um, how the city looks from a perspective of racial equity on these diseases? Yeah, I want to start by saying we share your sense of urgency and frustration in terms of not being able to turn the tide on, on these conditions uh, in the way that we have hoped to and uh, with the comprehensive types of approaches that we've tackled, that we've used to tackle these issues. Um, in terms of disparities, I know for diabetes rates, they're uh, very significant. I think that uh, Latino and black New Yorkers have rates about twice as high as white New Yorkers. Um, and similarly, that's similarly true for sugary drink consumption as well as for health outcomes like obesity in terms of uh, people of color in comparison to whites. Um, we think, I think we have to recognize that these problems are really complex and uh, they go to core inequities in our city. Um, the foundation of health comes from opportunities and resources and what's available to New Yorkers and those resources include things like housing, transportation, clean and safe parks, healthy and safe food. Um, and those resources have not been distributed equally throughout our city. And I know this is, I know this is a concern that you share. Um, we still believe that change in environments to increase opportunities for people to, be, to inc for people to be able to make healthier choices and to make those healthier choices easier, in the ways that we have done with the policy approaches that we have have pursued and the education approaches that we have pursued, can make a difference for New Yorkers, and that's why we're enthusiastic about the council's attention on these issues and uh, some of the proposals that you've in introduced today. Yes. Uh we need to look at the availability of healthy food. People are creatures of their environment, and the food that is provided in low-income areas of the city and communities of color in the city is markedly less healthy. It still remains true throughout the city that, um, that the most wholesome and healthy food is more expensive and generally less accessible for people in low-income communities, uh, hence the origin of the term food desert. Um, I live on 163rd Street in Washington Heights, and at my local bodega, you have to go eight freezers in to find a drink that is not uh, sugary. So if you want a diet drink or water, you have to go eight freezers in. And the average person is not going to make it to the eighth freezer. They're going to grab what's available. And again, this is beyond the scope of this hearing, but understanding the availability of healthy food and making sure it's accessible and affordable to every single person in the city is, is an absolutely key, key part 
of, of has to be a key part of our strategy. And you know, I'm so frustrated because back in the 70s and 80s, the science wasn't exactly settled on this, or, or at least it hadn't been disseminated yet. Um, and I've, I've often recounted uh, my, my uh, traumatizing incident from middle school where I had a class on health and I was taught that pepperoni pizza was healthy because it had all four food groups. <laughs> and, but, but we have learned so much since then and that information has been disseminated. We understand now you have to reduce processed foods. Uh, you, you need to, to reduce consumption of animal-based pro, pro, uh, products. Um, you certainly need to reduce the amount of added sugar, sugar period, in your diet, which is our focus today. And so the fact that we're not winning that war is enormously frustrating. And pushing the envelope on getting people information is really a key part of this hearing today. I want to pause and acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, a member of the, of the Health Committee, Councilmember Inez Barron, who's also the lead sponsor of Introduction 5. And I'm going to ask her to say some remarks about her bill, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for holding this very important hearing. And thank you to the panel and to the audience that's here as well to witness this. The bill is very simple. It simply says that where there are restaurants that have a seating capacity, that there be a chart that informs the uh, consumers that excessive, the risk of excessive sugar and carbohydrates, particularly for persons with diabetes and prediabetes. Similar to the salt shaker where you have a number two or number one salt shaker to indicate that. I think that perhaps many people have forgotten or do not, or never perhaps learn that carbs turn to simple sugars. So they've got to be aware that the process of digestion results in the sugar in the bloodstream. So this is an attempt to bring that awareness, to bring that familiarity. We know that there are, in fact, uh, the advertisements that are going forward now talking about the risk of smoking, what the conditions are that are caused by that. We know that there's a public campaign bringing awareness to the dangers of these excesses or the conditions that contribute to um, these chronic diseases that result. So that's what the bill talks about, and I'd like to know what's the position of the administration on the bill. Thank you so much for your question. We uh, also agree with you around the importance of this topic and the importance of bringing nutrition education and information about what's healthy to eat to all New Yorkers. Um, our concern with the bill is that providing information for people with diabetes or people with prediabetes uh, in a format as, such as a poster would be difficult. It would be difficult to craft a poster that would give meaningful and actionable information to people with diabetes in the restaurant environment. Um, and this is uh, because there really is no one-size-fits-all recommendation for people with diabetes in terms of what to consume, and the topic of carbohydrates is somewhat um, complicated uh, in terms of the way that carbohydrates appear in all different types of food, um, including fruits and vegetables and including uh, whole, whole grain foods that could be very much a part of a healthful diet. Um, and so in that way, it's complicated to translate this to a poster. and. Um, and we think it, that could be a, pose a challenge. We love challenges. It's an opportunity. So uh, I have several ideas about how we can get that done. You know, when I used to teach, and that's still my gift and my calling, and I think that's something that I'll always be um, in touch with. And I'm sure that amongst the 1.2 million school children that are out there, that they might be able to devise a very direct, simplistic poster which gets at what we're talking about. I believe it was a child who came up with the reduce, reuse, recycle symbol. And no, it's not in depth, it doesn't go all the way, but it gets the direct message that we need to be able to circulate. And I would think that somewhere amongst the 1.2 million children and the teachers that are committed to getting them to be creative, that there would be a way to get the message very directly. And I would want to know, would the administration consider that? Would the administration work with the DOE to talk about that as a campaign and look to see what we can come up with? 
along with the Department of Health and Mental, he uh, mental Health? Uh, we certainly are interested in any mechanisms that we think we can use to get healthful messages that can help people make healthier choices of it, uh, out. And working with the DOE is something that um, we do in a variety of different ways. Um, nutrition education is a core part of our activities. Uh, we have nutrition education in child care settings. We have nutrition education in farmers markets. Um, and we would we'd welcome the opportunity to discuss how we can help more New Yorkers understand what's helpful for them to eat. Um, and I think we'd, we'd look forward to doing that. So you mentioned nutrition education. What in the curriculum addresses nutrition? You brought it up, so. So um, I was speaking of nutrition education programming that the Department of Health offers, and not specifically DOE's nutrition education programming, which uh, I wouldn't be the best person to speak to. In terms of our programming, um, we offer, as I mentioned, nutrition education with that takes place in child care centers across New York City in low-income neighborhoods specifically, and that's designed to reach parents and staff as well as kids, and then also nutrition education in farmers markets throughout the city. And that co covers a whole host of topics um, from, from sodium to sugary drinks to using more produce at the farmer's markets. And it has a culinary component to it as well, a culinary education component to it as well. Do any of that, does any of that Im information, I've seen it in pamphlets and things of that nature. Does any of that information come in a direct kind of chart or? We have lots of um, different print collateral. Well, you have the plates and all of that. Yeah, we have lots of different information like that um, that, that is available call from calling 311. We also have information that we use and develop um, to educate providers or work with providers around increase in awareness of public health uh, information that we want them to share with their patients. Um, so on topics such as diabetes as well as hypertension and, and currently we are visiting providers in low-income neighborhoods uh, with a with a education kit that's about pediatric obesity and what providers can do around increasing awareness of pediatric obesity and, and addressing pediatric obesity. Well, I thank you for that, and I look forward to seeing how we can, uh, in fact, draw on the creativity and the intelligence and the ingenuity of our students, in particular, to come up with a poster that would be direct and to the point, considering all of the complexities of what carbohydrates do and how they're uh, synthesized differently in individuals that would address this issue. Because we certainly know that in particularly uh, communities of color, this is a high incidence. And it gets to be a question of inequity in providing services and information to those communities where there's a high incidence of these chronic diseases. And it's something that I think we need to address and not just talk about how complex it is and not have a plan to address it and resolve it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, wa I want to uh, continue uh, a few questions on the issue of sugar. And I want to uh, emphasize that our focus in this hearing is on uh, foods and drinks with added sugar, and, and wh why, why do we make that distinction? Um, too much sugar from any source um, can still be a health problem, but the reality is that the sugars that occur naturally in fruits are um, considered less worrisome, uh, one, because uh, fruits have some other beneficial uh, health qualities, and two, because uh, people are just less prone to binge eat. Uh, no one's going to sit down and eat eight apples in one sitting mm -hmm. the way uh, people are prone to eating chocolates and other things um, that have, have all the negatives without any of the positives. Um, and so our focus on, uh, on our bill for sugar labeling is on added sugar. And as I mentioned, um, added sugar in... in dishes or meals where one wouldn't expect to see it. Um, I understand that you agree with the spirit and intent of the bill, um, but that you have concerns about uh, legal matters and implementation. Um, could you explain, uh, again, uh, your concerns on, on the practicalities? 
As you indicated, um, we, we share your concern around added sugars, and we also recognize that the restaurant environment is uh, one that is challenging to make healthful choices in, and where more and more New Yorkers and people across the country are eating away from home, um, we think the restaurant environment can be an important place to act. Uh, in terms of challenges with this bill in particular, the issue is that added sugar information isn't available to us and it isn't available to customers in chain restaurants in New York City. So under uh, what restaurants are required to provide is to have nutrition information for their foods on site and the information that information would include the total sugars that are uh, in the food that they're offering, but not added sugars. Right. And as I understand this, we are... Um, victims of federal failures in this policy area where uh, the federal government really for decades has been slow to act on sugar. And this has been documented in part because of the influence of uh, the sugar lobby, big sugar, so to speak, which has managed to beat back a number of promising public policy interventions at the federal level. And um, so now today we're stuck with federal mandates on uh, menu and recipe reporting that are not including this critical, this, this critical piece of information. Uh, am I correct about that? Uh, you're correct about the status of the calorie labeling at the local level. So um, the federal government is very close to, the federal government has uh, made an announcement that will require that on packaged goods, the nutrition facts label that we're all used to looking at, at on packaged goods is going to require added sugars and that's um, coming into effect very shortly. So I believe it's in uh, January of next year that we'll begin to see that. Um, however, in their menu labeling requirements that are also in effect, um, don't don't include that piece about added sugars. They include total sugars only. Um, we were pleased to see the federal government have nutrition have menu labeling go into effect um, with the requirements of the Affordable Care Act and make that a, a nationwide requirement. It was something that was first adopted here in New York City, and so it's a positive step to see that it's being required nationally now. And it's also a positive step to know that added sugars will be required in packaged foods. Um, however, there is this gap where added sugar information is not, as a result of where the federal law is now, is not going to be available in restaurant settings. Um, we were able to have a successful sodium warning program, which survived a legal challenge. Uh, it's come to be appreciated by New Yorkers. I've even heard anecdotal stories of restaurants uh, adjusting their recipes so that they are under the threshold that requires the sodium warning. That to me is a great success. Um, if, we're, uh, if as a result of providing information to the public, restaurants feel obligated to make their menus more healthy, that's a win. Um, why, why, why do the technical challenges that you described for sugar not apply for sodium warnings? Uh, the sodium warning uh, goes on to any item that has more than 2,300 milligrams um, in that particular item, which is the federal guideline for the recommended maximum that, limit of what someone should consume in a day. And that information is available. That is part of what is required to be available um, on site uh, as a result of menu labeling. Well, here again, so the federal government was smart enough to define mm -hmm a suggested maximum sodium intake, but unless I've missed it, they haven't done it for sugar. And there have been some great uh, independent, I think the American Heart Association and others have defined it, but it doesn't have the force of law. And uh, it, it's, it's easy to see the hand of big sugar behind this because there's certainly a compelling public policy interest in the American people knowing um, what's too much sugar and th there is no agreed upon threshold there and so it's it's limiting our action at the local level and you you did mention some progress on the labeling for packaged goods with added sugar it's a miracle that got through the trump administration i guess he didn't notice it but that really is a great step forward um but but this hearing today is really not focused on packaged foods which are labeled um, 
this is really focused on restroom restaurant items where um, it's not clear what the recipe is or what the content is. And um, this, this is where we need to help New Yorkers who, as you point out, are, are still eating in restaurants, in chain restaurants at very, very, very high numbers. And I think it was you yourself who told me that a national study showed that something like 90% of families uh, got at least one meal for their child at a fast food restaurant over the course of a week, which is a shocking number. But on the plus side, it does mean that if we can intervene to make fast food restaurants healthier, then there's uh, the potential to really yield great benefits um, in the diet of young people in New York City and beyond. So I'm going to pause now. I want to first acknowledge we've been joined by fellow Health Committee member, Council Member Keith Powers, and I want to turn it over to our colleague Ben Kalos for his questions. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, hashtag three committees one time. It's good to be right back. Uh, <laughs> When we heard this legislation previously, uh, the administration was not supportive. Uh, now the administration and the mayor are supportive. Can you share uh, what changed in the past couple of years? We um, are we are happy to be able to support this bill. Um, we think it will set norms um, that are important to help parents and caregivers make the right choices for their kids. Um, it sends a very strong signal that sugary drinks have no place in the diet of children. Um, so we appreciate you bringing attention to this. The change was that the prior legislation uh, had, a, had comprehensive nutrition standards for um, the whole host of what was offered in the restaurant setting, which would have been challenging from an enforcement perspective. So uh, we think this is uh, feasible to implement. It's already been done in a number of places and will be very important for raising awareness and understanding of the implications of sugary drinks um, for kids. The original legislation tied only to incentive children's meals with incentive items. This legislation applies to all children's meals. Uh, is, does that change uh, way one way or another? Um, I understood that with that with regard to the incentive items and this was for children's meals it, um, we will be interested to talk further in terms of some of the definitions and around the bill to make it a little uh, easier for enforcement and to, to match some of our existing language in the health code uh, the past legislation was more comprehensive in terms of its approach so in terms of once meals were covered by the legislation it had uh -huh. nutrition standards for a broader uh, set of foods being offered which would have been more complicated from an enforcement uh, enforcement standpoint. And I think one of the things that we saw is that this that legislation had been modeled on San Francisco and uh, the committee report which anyone can download on the internet at uh, council.nyc.gov indicates that uh, some of the research found that it that all that ended up happening was a 10 cent fee was added in order to acquire the toy which made it non-bundled somehow so uh, how many restaurants will this apply to? Uh, we don't actually know how many restaurants it will apply to. There's about 25,000 restaurants in New York City, or 24,000, I think. Um, and we don't know which ones are offering meals that are aimed at children. That's something that I think we would be learning as we went through the, um, on up the, ramp, the ramp up stage for this bill. And, and DOHMH has folks who can engage and look at the children that go. So what would... I'm sorry, this is, I'm, I'm an operations type person. So would you be sending folks to each restaurant to inspect the menu, or would you just be, and I'm not plugging a specific company, but like whether it's seamless or, or something else where you just hop online and look at the menus and see if there's a kid's menu or not? Um, we, this, would be, this is really the first step in the process for us. So uh, once the bill is finalized, we would look into um, developing compliance guides and understanding from industry how the bill fits with their operating environment. Um, and then we always, always with any kind of legislation that impacts the restaurant environment, make ourselves available for questions and take it from there in terms of implementation. Um, so I believe it would have to do, I mean, at some point there would have to be an analysis of, of what the menu indicates in terms of whether or not meals being offered are for kids. With regards to um, your suggestion, uh, currently the legislation would allow for uh, flavored milk, you're recommending a calorie cap on 
flavored milks. Uh, why 130 calories? Why not 50 calories or 150 calories? I just did a quick search and different milk, d different flavored milk products have different calorie limits. Similarly, alternative milk products have different calorie counts. So where, where would you see the calorie count and has the administration had any conversations uh, with industry about how that would impact them? Um, we are recommending the 130 calorie count to be consistent with the New York City food standards. The food standards apply to all of the meals and snacks that are offered uh, through New York City Food Service or any, any food service that's funded by us. And for food service that is for kids, we have even stricter standards, um, particularly for sugary drinks. So no sugary drinks are available through any of the settings that offer food to kids. Um, but flavored milks can be served and they have a calorie cap, which um, makes them that much more healthful than, sugar, than flavored milk that went over the calorie cap. Does milk offer any nutritional value over and above uh, other beverages, such as uh, water, flavored water, uh, or um, juice? Um, milk has different, different nutritional benefits than those other items. So it's high in calcium, it's high in vitamin D, it's a source of protein, so it, it does have a place in a healthful diet for kids. We recommend unflavored milk in general. Um, but we think a calorie cap would be helpful here. With regards to other places in your testimony, you indicated that DOHMH is playing a role in child care centers and public schools, uh, which was good to hear because I thought we were federally preempted, so I actually want to learn a little bit, if I may, just uh, are the are public schools, do we have better nutritional standards in public schools? I think some folks who have seen our legislation have said, uh, well, how, if your legislation is doing all this, how do, do we still have canned soda for sale and vending machines in public schools? Where are we in the other environments that you're looking, which are community and faith-based organizations, child care centers, and public schools? Um, yes, in public schools, we have worked in partnership with DOE for a long time to make those settings more uh, health promoting. So in addition, as part of the New York City food standards, there are standards for the meals and the snacks that are served, and those do apply to school meals. School meals also have to comply with federal guidelines, as you indicated, um, but they comply with both the federal guidelines and the New York City local standards, um, which in some cases, in some aspects, are more stringent than what's required by the federal government. And that's been a long time process. Of, uh, those have been in place since 2008 in New York City, so we've been working hand-in-hand -hand with, with DOE in terms of the in terms of the adherence to the New York City food standards for some time. As part of the New York City food standards, there's also beverage standards, and those have strict requirements for any beverage, um, for any uh, vending machines that are available in DOE settings. Um, so there are calorie thresholds on what can be offered to kids and requirements that there's no artificial sweeteners either. So in New York City schools, in our vending machines, there are not sugary drinks available for youth. What, what would somebody? What would somebody find in a, in a vending machine in a school cafeteria or in a public school? I don't know what the current um, procurements are for, for uh, DOE, but I think um, there in the past there have been things like very lightly, lightly sweetened with a small amount of juice uh, okay. in terms of the kinds of items that might be available or flavored seltzers or flavored, lightly flavored waters. I don't think I have a vending machine at most of the high schools in my district, but I, I did go to the 80th anniversary for Bronx Science and I feel like the vending machine was still there in the corner and it still had all the stuff that uh, as a high school student I might make the poor choice to get the most calories possible at four o'clock when that snack time uh, came around. Uh, in terms of the uh, marketing of sugary beverages to, to youth, you mentioned that in your testimony, uh, is that something that you're still seeing? Yeah, marketing, um, sugary drinks are heavily marketed to everyone. They're aggressively marketed to everyone. Um, and they're, they're especially, that is especially true in low-income communities and communities of color. We know that there's just a saturation of sugary drink messages in certain communities. Um, and something that we've tried to bring attention to, including with a recent media campaign that called attention to the role of marketing and, and promoting of sugary drinks. And we've done research with NYU, and I hope to have them here, where they studied the impacts of the first bill, and they, I believe, will hopefully hear what the impacts of 
this uh, would be. And so uh, in your testimony, you indicated that uh, a quarter of New York City children age zero to five, which like scares the dickens out of me because my daughter is a year old, are having one or more sugary drinks daily, which scares me <laughs> a lot because uh, my daughter's still on milk or water. Uh, so you're really seeing this trend, and, and how in your testimony you indicate that black and Latino children were more likely. How much more significantly? Is it a couple percentage, or is it twice as? What's the difference in that in age group? Um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, in that great age group, there was a there was a really serious gap. It was, um, I believe, three or four times more likely for black or Latino children as compared to white children in the zero to five, and that was the first time that we had collected data among that age in that age group. Um, among other youth and New Yorkers in general, I I do uh, want to share that. Um, we have actually made a lot of progress in sugar drink consumption in terms of reducing rates. So there is, we have seen that from the comprehensive effects that the, that the city in partnership with others, many other stakeholders throughout the city, the administration in, in partnership with many others, um, our efforts have yielded declines in sugary drink consumption in New York City. But we, but the, uh, you know, as you're, as you are pointing out and as our data shows, those rates are still far too high. Um, and especially to see those, those numbers for our youngest New Yorkers is extremely concerning. Thank you very much for your support. We look forward to working with you on uh, the New York City food standards and uh, complying the legislation and uh, for getting this done. It's, it's been eight years. Uh, how quickly do you think you can get it implemented? I don't think that's exclusively up to us. So we'll, we'll, we would work with you um, in terms of developing that timeline. Thank you. Monday at 9 a.m. it is. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councilmember Kalos, uh, for this great bill. And I'm going to pass it off to our colleague, Councilmember Powers. Sure. Thank you. I'm sorry I missed your testimony, but I had an opportunity to, to catch up and read it. Um, I am supportive of uh, all sort of the public health efforts, well, most of the public health efforts that give consumers more direct information about what they're eating, particularly because even on the packaging, I know they're doing some reforms there, but when you, re when you buy a bag of chips or candy or whatever it may be, you know, okay, but chips or things like that, like the serving sizes always seem to be completely uh, uh, misinformative to somebody about how much what the health uh, standards is. And then when you go to a restaurant, you uh, often get little information about what you're actually eating and how much they're adding into it in a in sort of in a climate where they're trying to get you to eat more and, and, and to return and things like that. So um, I, I am supportive of 1326, which gives more information than and I share the chair's um, belief that there's some way we can get to this. I understand it's not federal standards and there's not, um, uh, and there's other sort of considerations here, but, um, but certainly supportive of some place to give the consumer more information about what their what their intake is on any specific thing. Um, all of this is obviously around around sugar. Um, all of this also comes into context when we talk about prior efforts around sugar, beverage sizes, things like that. So, can you tell us about? Any, I, and I'm sorry if I missed part of it, but any any efforts just generally here in the city, have you guys kind of reconsidered or thought about the size? Uh, mandate again that Mayor Bloomberg put forward. If so, is there a position on it? Um, other efforts to try to curb sugar intake, not just uh, that, that really um, is about changing consumer behavior in restaurant or retail? Uh, yeah, we, um, sugary drinks remain a top priority for the department and the administration and reducing consumption is our shared goal that we have with you. Uh, what we have been doing to build upon some of the policies that were put in place earlier, uh, like uh, removing sugary drinks from childcare settings and making sure that any 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 uh, setting where New York City is serving food, sugary drinks aren't available, is also building on our public education efforts and our community-based um, programming to reduce consumption of sugary drinks. So that includes things like the media campaigns, which I've referenced already. We also have partnerships with CBOs to mobilize people around awareness around sugary drinks. Um, and there are the nutrition education efforts, which I mentioned too. Um, in terms of policy, we've been excited to see the momentum on sugary drink policy that's been happening across the country. There's a lot of different innovative types of approaches, including taxes being adopted at the local level, 
um, and, and policies like Kids Meals, which uh, we are enthousi enthusiastic to see taking place here. And so we're, we're looking forward to continue to explore what could be a, the best kind of approach. We think there is a role for policy in reducing sugary drink consumption. And is that a fair way to say that the administration doesn't have a position today on the size of the beverage? The administration doesn't have a position today. Okay. And can you tell me about other policies in other cities or states? I think there's San Francisco and some of those cities have adopted policies around either the children's menus or just around sugar consumption or, or, um, or uh, consumer understanding of it. That you, are there specific ones that you guys feel like New York City should be evaluating or adopting? The other kind of policies that uh, we've been seeing across the country, I, I mentioned already. So kids meals is one um, that's been adopted in a number of places. It's been one of the more popular ways for localities to to move forward and address sugary drinks and, and remind people that sugary drinks have no role in a children's diet. Um, and some, similarly, taxes have been adopted in a number of jurisdictions. A warning label has been pursued and considered, or legislation around warning labels have been introduced in a number of places. Um, and those are the ones that com are coming to mind now. California actually just introduced legislation around portions, too. So there's a lot of momentum. And we're, we're watching that closely and interested to see how those things develop. Got it. Thanks. And I'm sorry that I missed part of this, but can you just lay out the concerns with 1326? There's a, I heard one part was a federal, lack of a federal standard for what's too much. Is that correct? And uh, yeah, so there is actually federal guidance in terms of added sugar consumption. So the federal guidance, it's a little bit different than sodium. It's not um, one number of a maximum limit, but the federal guidance is that we don't consume more than 10% of our calories from added sugars. And so for most people, that would be about 50 grams of added sugar per day. Um, or for the 2,000 calorie diet. And I think what many people don't realize is how easy it is to do that just by drinking one sugary drink. Um, a one 20 ounce bottle of sugary drink can contain even 75 grams of added sugar. And for kids, it's even easier to go over that daily limit. So a, kid, a kid's uh, max for added sugar would be much, much lower. Something for, an, for a moderately active eight year old, it's more like 40 grams of sugar. And that could be easily consumed in just one sugary drink. Okay, and that's that's just about the federal standard. What are the other? Concerns? So, in terms of the concerns with the with the legislation, um, it's just the fact that the added sugar information isn't available to us. Restaurants are not required to make available added sugar information. They're required to make available total sugar information. Total sugar information. Total sugar in every single item they serve. Total sugar in every single item that they serve. And um, because, um, as Councilmember Levine spoke about, sugars appear naturally in a number of foods, including fruits and including dairy, um, that means that it would be difficult to identify what, are, what items have just, what items are at a different added sugar threshold. Got but it. the bill would be implementable if the change was to focus on sugar in general? Sorry, Councilmember. That was gonna be my next question, so. Um, if, so information that is available at different restaurant sites includes total sugars. So, so theoretically, you have a federal sort of guidelines about the 10, we know what sort of the average intake should be calorie wise. We have sort of a federal standard around 10%. We have existing menu labeling, I believe, around sodium. And we have some information yeah. about total input. That seems like the genesis of a regular, <laughs> like some sort of, I mean, it seems like the bill that we're discussing, one of the main problems here is actually just the, not having the added value information. I think to the chair's point was my next question is whether you could just take total sugar because it's still, whether it's added or, or natural sugar, it still seems like there's some, should, you know, there should be some limit on how much you intake. So just to just to make clear, what the federal guidance is about is about added sugar. Right, no, I understand that. Yes. Um, and I think in, in terms of uh, additional ways of approaching this, we'd be interested to discuss that with you, and it's an interesting idea and suggestion. Are, are there federal guidelines around total sugar? There are not. Not, okay. Um, and going to sodium, um, what are the current New York City regulations around sodium? There's a There's a... Uh, display if it's over 2,300 grams of sodium for a restaurant. That's correct. Yes. And um, are there are, have there been any other considerations of the Department of Health around sodium intake, whether it's either in retail restaurants or otherwise? 
Um, yeah, we sodium is another top priority for us as one of the things um, that people we want people to be consuming less of, and that we know all Americans and New Yorkers as well are consuming a much more much more on average than the daily recommended limit. Um, in addition to the sodium warning rule through the New York City food standards, we set um, we set stringent sodium requirements for what's offered in New York City environments, and then we do a lot of education, including media campaign awareness around sodium as well. Got it. And I, I, I'm not necessarily saying I'm supportive of this, but I just posing the question. Have I know there? I think there's been some conversation in the past around placement of items in retail settings and things like that. Is that something that the department's considering? Yes, that's a. Um that's a kind of programmatic approach that we take. We can work with small retailers, for example, through the Shop Healthy program, um, and that has a number of steps we could ask retailers to take, like a, like a corner store bodega or a local supermarket, in terms of making that environment more health-promoting or easier to navigate. And so it would be things like uh, offering a healthy lunch meal, um, making uh, make sure make sure that you're stocking low sodium items, having uh, shelf talkers that would indicate where healthier items are. So steps like that that we think uh, can help make all environment um, retail environments healthier. But those are uh, programmatic efforts. And, and what's the incentive for a retailer to to decide to change their store format to sell healthy items first and unhealthy, maybe more popular items? Um, well, we work in that program. We work closely with retailers, so we offer technical assistance. There's also community-based supporters who may be advocating for that kind of change, and we'll provide tools to community members who want to advocate for that kind of change or work with a particular store. Um, we think there there are a lot of examples where, you know, uh, the department is certainly supportive of making these sorts of changes, but we're not acting alone. Um, one of those would be the Healthy Beverage Zone project that's taking place in the Bronx, which is something where the department, through our Neighborhood Action Center there, is a member of a coalition, um, but we're just one stakeholder in this coalition that's using a collective impact model to uh, provide to pr to make a call to action to different CBOs and stakeholders in the Bronx to um, adopt sugary drink policies, make sugary drinks not available in their settings, and and raise awareness about sugary drink. And so that's an an example that's being really led by community partners. And so we think there's um, champions and supporters all across New York City for reducing sodium and sugar consumption. Got it. Okay. Um, I think those are my questions. I think we touched on Department of uh, Education and now some other initiatives. So. Thanks. Thank you for the answers. Thank you, Council Member. How many restaurants receive a grade today? A letter grade. Um, rough, so rough number. <laughs> I'm checking with Corinne, but I think it's about. It should be about twenty-four thousand. The same. All restaurants in New York City. About twenty. Twenty-four thousand. Got it's it. The numbers between twenty-four and twenty-five thousand. Yes. Now our bill for sugar warning labels is a subset of that because it's only restaurants with fifteen outlets or more. Do you have an estimate on how many restaurants? would be included in that definition? I think that's about 3,000 or a little bit over 3,000. So it is pretty incredible that there are 3,000 fast food establishments in the five boroughs. It, it's kind of a sober reminder of, of just how many New Yorkers are getting their food from fast food establishments, which is why we're here. But this is it's still very much a mass market phenomena. Um, even with all the health awareness that they were talking about earlier in the hearing. Now, the, uh, assuming we implement uh, either the limitations on children's meals or the warnings or, or any of these other bills, um, they're only going to be as good as enforcement, and that requires inspectors. Those are presumably DOH, MH inspectors. Um, you have a force out there already um, doing various uh, inspecting for very compliance with various um, health codes. Uh, do you have an estimate on the additional staffing that would be needed to cover um, if, if we implement these bills today uh, for a workforce that I think it's fair to say is already uh, pretty overstretched? Uh, uh, no. I, so I don't have any estimate on that today. I, I did wouldn't just um – Note that the chain restaurants in New York City are a variety of different types of restaurants. So some are fast food, some are fast casual, some may even be sit down, and some of them may be, um, they have a variety of different types of menu items that they offer, in addition to what we might typically think of the fast food chains that we all know well. Yes, I think many of the fast casual restaurants offer the illusion of healthfulness, <laughs> but often um, 
are serving menu items that have uh, just as much sodium and sugar and uh, and fat content and, and et cetera. So um, I think we're absolutely right to include them uh, in this legislation, and I don't want to let them off the hook either um, as a place to, to intervene to help New Yorkers uh, eat better. Um, I'll, I'll, I just want to emphasize that that uh, we think about the workforce uh, needed to ensure compliance um, and that we try not to uh, just simply add more of a workload onto the, dis- the existing uh, force of inspectors because that probably means uh, things are going to fall through the cracks or that an insufficient number of restaurants will be inspected. Um, so as we move forward on discussing these bills, just want to urge the department to think about the staffing needs, particularly since it's budget time and we're looking at the health department budget and um, we want to make sure that you're adequately staffed for uh, a function that does directly impact public health in this city. Um, I want to thank the administration uh, for, for speaking today. We have a long list of, of members of the public uh, who we're going to ask to testify. So we're all, we are going to move on. But thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for the opportunity. And um, we're going to call up a panel of advocates, one of whom has been waiting very, very patiently, and I think is arguably the best behaved member of the public in this hearing, and that is Rose Devoli and her sidekick, Michael Devoli, uh, who by day works for the American Cancer Society. Um, we're also going to uh, invite up uh, the, the one and only and incredible Robin Vitale from the American Heart Association, as well as Claire Wang from the New York Academy of Medicine. That'll be our first panel. We'll do this. We need to keep a phone book around here for uh, <laughs> boosting up. Uh, <laughs> um, welcome, Rose. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, are you uh, planning on speaking, or are you just here to support Dad? If you'd like words? to speak, you can kick us off. Do you want me to start? All right. Uh, so. Um, Good afternoon, council member. Uh, good afternoon, the committee. And thank you all so much for, for giving us an opportunity to speak this morning or this afternoon. Um, I'm going to speak very briefly, and then I am going to sort of turn it over to Rose here for a moment. Uh, my name is Michael DeVoli. I'm the director of government relations for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network here in New York City. Um, I'm not going to go through and recite any of the stats that you've heard this morning. Obviously, uh, I think everyone here understands the the, the grim statistics that we, we're seeing when it comes to obesity. Um, but one thing I just want to emphasize is the direct connection between obesity and cancer. When you look at um, cancers in New York City, when you look at cancers in New York State and nationwide, 18% of all cancers are directly linked to obesity. And so it is often not something that we think of when we think of, we think of obesity directly connected to heart disease. We don't necessarily think of it linked directly to cancer. And so that is something when, when you look at, you know, other than smoking, there's no greater cause of cancer than obesity. Uh, and so that is why the American Cancer Society is so, you know, highly, so in, in, interested in this issue. Um, when you look at cancer rates in New York City, they vary by borough, they vary by neighborhood, they vary by race and ethnicity, just like obesity does, just like sugary drink consumption does. And so we are here today actively in support of intro 1064. Uh, we very much believe that we need to do everything in our power to help keep our kids healthy. 
And while we are we are fully supportive of the general mission of what the committee is doing today, we have to limit our testimony just to the sort of 1064 in terms of the sugary drink uh, consumption. Um, I, uh, though, you know, it was interesting that the commissioner's office, when they talked about placing a, a calorie cap. Uh, on the sugary drink on the the healthy kids meal bill that is something that we would definitely be interested in exploring as well we are comfortable with the bill as it is and we do strongly support it as it is but if that was something that the council was interested in exploring we would definitely be interested uh, in exploring that with them um, so I want to just stop on, on and just very quickly on a personal note um, I am someone who has has struggled with my weight all my life I think about the the you know a dollar ten is what I my parents would give me to go to school every day for lunch and I would get two chocolate chip cookies and two chocolate milks and I've struggled with my weight all my life and my mission as a as a father of a six year old and a one year old is to help them lead a healthy life and every single day as parents as a community we ensure you know our job is to ensure that our kids eat healthy at home. When you send them to school, we want them to eat healthy at school. Often, more and more often, people are eating out. Their parents are eating out, kids are eating out. In fact, you know, it was, fi it was fascinating to me at the Starbucks down the street, I grabbed a quick cup of coffee. Um, the only milk that they had there was chocolate and vanilla with 22 grams of sugar in each of those. The only vanilla flavored milk, the only juice they had there was sugar sweetened juice. And while that's that that is not a that wasn't a kid's menu, that showed a that captures the problem that we have here. Is that a parent rushing to simply want to give their kids something healthy, it's just not that easy. So um, so let me just start up, Rose. Do you wanna can you say wanna just say a quick words? What is it, you know, you, you dictated this to me and then I typed it up for you. So what is it you think? Why is it that a, ki a, a kid needs to be healthy and eat and drink healthy? Just say what you have. Are you going to be shy now? You clearly can't be my child if you're shy. <laughs> Come on, do you want to say anything? If you want to read what you, what you told me? Or maybe dad can read what you All right, told that's him. fine. So, so this is what, so we talked about this last night. So uh, it's important that kids like me eat healthy. Eating healthy will help me grow up big, strong, and smart. Sugar is a treat and should not be something we eat every day. My mom and dad give me healthy food and drinks. This idea will help me, uh, help keep me and my sister healthy. That was outstanding testimony. <laughs> outstanding and an important contribution. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. you Rose, I get, I get shy sometimes too. And the best thing to do is just pretend no one's in the room and that you're just here with your dad and one of their friends. Do you want to say anything else just to add on? You don't have to if you don't want to. Come on. That's <laughs> okay. Mommy's watching. Do you want to just say hi, See Mom? The camera? Want to say hi, Mommy? See that camera up there? Okay. All right, don't worry about ahead. it. Rose, you're a tough act to follow. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair, and, uh, and we want to obviously thank you for your leadership on this very much. My name is Raman Vitale, I serve as Vice President of Health Strategies for the American Heart Association here in New York City. And we are strongly supportive of this entire conversation. You know, sugary drinks and, and the consumption of added sugars is a very significant health concern for us um, in our focus around um, you know, really thinking about health and wellness across all channels for, for all New Yorkers. Um, this measure, um, 1064 and 1326, we believe very strongly will be so, um, effective policies to help broaden the, the awareness and really think about the norms of our diet and nutrition. My testimony has a little bit more detailed information relative to uh, the stats and the figures and all of those uh, useful information about why we're here to support this. Um, we do have other advocates that are slated to testify that I think will speak more directly to that point. Um, so my testimony I really want to drive into some of the more technical details. Um, and, and around kids meals we've been working with uh, 
Councilmember Kalos on this measure for the entire timeline that he mentioned. I was reflecting earlier that when we first started this campaign together, um, neither one of us were parents, and now we both have young ones at home, so it's, uh, it's become much more personal for us, um, but it's just really crystallized um, why we're doing this. Before it was about the science and the research, now it's about our families. So I, I really am deeply in indebted to uh, Councilmember Kalos for your long, long support on this. And indeed, the Heart Association um, was privileged to work with Leroy Kymery when he first started talking about this. Um, I have correspondence going back to 2009 on this issue. So um, it's a long time coming. We're very excited to not only have the council's uh, support, to have the administration support, and we look forward to seeing this finally implemented. That'll be a very exciting day for us, for sure. On uh, Chair, on your proposal on Intro 1326, we also are very supportive of the intent of the, uh, the policy. Um, we share your enthusiasm for what we're seeing around the sodium warning icon. We are very supportive of that as well. Um, sodium consumption as well as added sugars consumption are, I think, very uh, appropriate areas of focus for the city to be prioritizing. Um, as was um, outlined by the administration with the previous testimony from the health department, there are some technical edits that we would like to, to see happen um, just to make sure that it is going to be something that's enforceable, um, that is in line with the, the current public health research, um, and ultimately something that, uh, that will be um, you know, impactful in as much as, as the intent is behind it. Um, so with all of that, we again are, are deeply grateful for your leadership. We look forward to uh, the, the movement on both of these bills and um, certainly um, deeply appreciative of your focus around this important health topic. Thank you, Robin, for all your great work and being a force for good health policy and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. One. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, I'm specifically speaking to the proposed Healthy Kids Meal, um, intro 1064. My name is Claire Wong, uh, and I am the Vice President for Research Evaluation and Policy at the New York Academy of Medicine. I'm also a young professor at Columbia University's Millman School of Public Health. Uh, where uh, the Academy was established in 1847. Um, we've been dedicated to ensuring every adult and every child has the opportunity to thrive and be healthy. Such vision, we all know that it requires more than just quali high quality health care. It requires the entire community to work together to ensure the environment in which our children learn, play, and grow are healthy and safe. With one in three children and adolescents in the United States suffer from obesity and overweight, obesity remains a serious threat to children's health in the United States and in the city. And overconsumption of sugary beverages is a major contributor. According to my research, a 12-ounce soda typically offered as part of a kid's meal can contain 150 calories and more than nine teaspoons of sugar. For an eight-year-old, that would, um, he or she would need to walk the distance between the city hall and Times Square in order to walk the calories off. Thanks to the effort championed by the Department of Health and, and, and Mental Hygiene, um, and many cross-sectorial partnerships. We now have policies in place to ensure nutritional standards were, in, were reinforced in schools and childcare centers. We also have seen education and media campaigns to make sure um, sugary beverages are less ubiquitous, but we do believe more work is needed. This is also a matter of health equity. While these beverages contain absolutely no nutrients, they're heavily marketed to low-income neighborhoods and communities of color. Healthy default alone would not eliminate childhood obesity, of course, but it is a step in the right direction. It is especially important for younger children who are still forming their taste preferences and dietary norms. The truth is many chain restaurants have already removed sugary beverages from their menus and it has become a state law in California. We believe that the Healthy Kids Meal proposal is a sensible policy and can strengthen market incentives for developing healthier menus for children. For these reasons, the Academy fully supports the bill, and again, we thank you for the opportunity to testify on this important issue. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the excellent panel. Um, I just want to emphasize one point which Michael brought up, which is the trend of people cooking less at home and eating more out. And that means they don't know what's in their food. The beauty of cooking at home is you can see everything you're putting in, you know if it's fresh, you know if it's healthy, you know if you're adding sugar, 
And when you go out to eat, you might not. And I think underlying the motivation for a lot of these bills is to try and intervene in the face of that trend to make sure that what people do eat uh, is healthier and that at a minimum they know what they're putting in their bodies like they would if they were preparing it at home. Um, we think this is an important uh, response to that uh, trend, which has so many implications. Um, I know we have a lot of members of the public. Some, do you, you have a quick question? All right, we're going to pass it off to... I, I, will, I will be quicker than I was with the uh, previous uh, panel. Uh, I guess to the other parents on the panel, it seems like even when you choose something that's labeled a baby or kids or healthy, when you spin it over, it can have a lot of sugar and it uh, added sugar. You have to end up reading through the ingredients. Uh, how, how, how can this help in, in parenting? And I swear to God, I can't believe you saw vanilla flavored. <laughs> I've, I've never heard of that and I can't believe that's a thing. That that vanilla and chocolate flavor milk is all that they I, sell. I get the chocolate at, uh, milk, but yeah, it's there's 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 a whole slew of different flavored milks, and and they're it's a they're sold by uh, a company that promotes organic milk, and so that's one of the challenges that okay. so you think something is healthy, it's healthy in maybe one respect, but not so in the other respect, and and that's one of the challenges. And that look, that's why what you're doing here today and what's why this hearing is so important is it's, it's exposing a lot of the, the hidden places that sugar is constantly found. Yeah, and if I may, I think one of the pivotal parts of, of all this discussion is really helping to support parents in exactly that purpose. So right now it's incumbent for the parents to do their homework, to, to really work steadfastly to make sure that things that they're buying for their, their kids, things that they assume are healthy, indeed actually are, because there's so much uh, misguided or, or uh, mislabeled, to just be blunt, um, food out there. Um, and so I think when you're, you're thinking about the norms that we're instilling in our children, measures like the, the 1064 and, and 1326 will help to really turn that on, on the side. So whereas right now we have to fight harder to get the healthier foods, these measures will help us to make healthy foods more accessible, make that the norm. If you want to have the occasional sugary drink as a treat, if uh, you as a parent make that decision, you can still get that. And I think that's part of the sensible, responsible way this bill is drafted. We're not banning anything. We're not restricting parents' rights. We're simply asking for the norm to be the healthier option. Uh, so I've gotten some questions from the media about the initial version of the legislation that was tied to children's meals that had incentive items associated with them and what happened in San Francisco versus focusing on sugary beverages. Uh, what, it, what is the American Heart Association's take on uh, the, the change and what we learned from other cities. Yeah, you know, over the, the 10 years or so that we've been working on this issue, the evolution of science has been, I think, uh, moving along in, in the same space as we've been thinking about how to address these concerns in New York City. Um, so what we've learned um, in those early days is that the, the toy, the incentive piece, um, it's very easy to create loopholes around that, as you mentioned in your opening comments. Um, and there's a long list of other restaurants that don't have the toy incentive, but are marketing to kids that would not be impacted in that space. Um, so if we're thinking about the most impactful, most equitable policy, um, having it a, a tribute to all restaurants, if you have a kid's menu, that they would have to have these healthy options uh, makes good sense. Now, the concern around uh, both the food standards and the beverage standards, um, I think that's unique for New York City. Um, the Heart Association across the country would be very supportive of food criteria as well. We would love to see the city get to a place where that can also be manageable. Um, we hear the concerns from the health department. We understand that the complications around enforcement and implementation. Um, so we think the beverages are a, a good first step, and we are strongly supportive of the current bill draft. Um, and we'll see what we might be able to do down the road. In your testimony, you indicated that uh, in the detailed uh, four-page testimony, which anyone can read at council.nyc.gov, uh, you indicate that uh, parents still have a choice. They can still choose to spend that one sugary beverage a week, which is allowed, not every day. <laughs> but I, And so uh, why is the right to choose so important, and how would that work? 
Well, I, I think, you know, again, this is um, turning the norm around so that right now parents have to fight extra hard to get the healthier drink options as opposed to what we're recommending here is that healthy options are the norm and parents can ask for that, that sugary drink if they so choose. Um, you know, I think New York City is, is very well established as a leader in, in appropriate evidence-based public health policy and allowing the parents to continue to have that, uh, that authority. How they're going to parent is at their own jurisdiction and, and their own discretion. Um, but obviously, I think this helps to educate all New Yorkers, and particularly parents and young you know, people, that, uh, that they need to be mindful about what they're consuming. And the occasional sugary drink is perhaps something that they can be comfortable with. We'd obviously be encouraged to only focus on healthy drink options, um, but certainly there is uh, some room in, in diet and in nutrition science to allow for the occasional treat to happen. And if I may have one last question, uh, I see in the New York Academy of Medicine reference to a uh, piece by a uh, Wang Y. C. That's me. Uh, I was <laughs> curious about that and the caloric calculator, average caloric impact of childhood obesity interventions. And uh, I see you're not wearing a white coat, but you are in fact a doctor and are now playing one on TV. <laughs> if you can share with us some of the, uh, uh, what you learned in your, re in your research published in 2013 uh, on pages E3 through 13. <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, so I'm, tra um, I'm trained as a physician epidemiologist. So that piece of work is part of our effort to calculate, um, you know, many people might say a calorie is a calorie. And all you needed to do is to exercise more in order to burn it off. Um, in our opinion, that is a complicated and sometimes dangerous message that some of the um, uh, industry voices might um, push. Um, because, in fact, when you do the math, you could see that how difficult it is to burn off these calories. And uh, that came from these uh, added sugar that's added into the sugary water that has absolutely no nutrients. Um, so the example I used there is a uh, quote unquote kid size uh, soda that's served in kids' meals. Um, in order to burn that off, you do um, for an average, um, average eight year old. Um, he or she will have to walk for 70 minutes in order to burn that off. So for um, any active individuals and, and children, we'll know that we want them to be more active, but in, in fact, when you do the math and, and really figuring out how much calories are in these drinks, they could be very, uh, very deceiving. So that was a gist of what the body of research is about, um, to really be conscious about the caloric content and sugar content in these beverages. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to this great panel. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Miguel Graham and Joshua Delgado from Teens for Food Justice. We have Minister John Williams from the New Creation Community Health Empowerment. Anna Flateau and Chris, oh boy, uh, Nowax Norwood. All right, from Health People. Yes, I do. Thank you. These seats were so comfortable. Here we go. go to sleep. Those seats were comfortable. Thank you. Oh. They're together, I think. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just stepping your coat, Reverend Williams. That's all right. All right. Thank you. Joshua and Miguel, thank you for joining us. You have a hard act to follow with Rose, <laughs> but we're glad the youth voice is in the house. And um, would you like to start us off? Sure. Hi, my name is Miguel. Shut up. Calm down, calm down. Life is good. Can you share your names on social media, whether it's like Twitter or Instagram and things like that? We'll share it. Hi, my name is Miguel, and I'm a 10th grade student at Dewey Clinton High School campus. 
I'm also a member of Teen for Full Justice after school apprenticeship program where we explore food justice issues and advocate for healthy food and drinks access in our community. I'm here to testify in support of Bill 1064 because I believe kids should not only have access to healthy food but also healthy beverages on restaurant menus. <clears throat> Hi, my name is uh, Joshua Delgado. I'm a senior at the Clayton High School campus. Like Miguel, I am a part of Team for Food Justice as both an intern on our hydroponics farm <laughs> and a member of apprenticeship. I'm also here to express my support of Bill 1064 because I think that we deserve to have a, to have the the option to make healthy choices. <sighs> oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Behind our hydroponic farm and cafeteria, and that includes drinks on restaurant menus. We support this bill that would require restaurants in New York City that serve children meals to include drinks that are free of added sugars and sweeteners. After going into our communities to survey restaurants and analyze food and drink menus, we find lots of soda and sugary drinks like Sprite, Fanta, and High C, but very, very few healthy options. During apprenticeship, we learn a lot about food and drinks access in our community and what it means for our health, own health. And we began, we, well, we began to go beyond the classroom and decided to explore options on restaurant menu. As a group, we created a survey that include, included a look at drinks on kids' menu and the availability of healthy substantion. We found that sugary beverages were always the default. Also, the way they featured the, in kids' meal section or in the restaurant themselves seems this 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 displayed to catch the eyes of young people <clears throat> i have learned and now know that companies often target teenagers and younger people by using colorful and catchy marketing in order to influence us to consume more sugary beverages these tactics work because restaurants and companies know how to tie our products to recent pop culture and imagery to capture our attention. As a student, I am busy and don't always have the time to carefully consider restaurant menus when I buy a quick lunch meal. Oh, lunch. Sometimes I make the choice that are most familiar and easy. So if kids' menus were to offer drinks free of sugar and sweeteners, then the healthier choice would be that much easier to make. Thank you for allowing us to testify before you in support of this important bill 
we're happy to answer any question that you have. That was outstanding. Thank you, Miguel and Joshua. Really uh, impressive testimony and important. We thank you for being here. Uh, well, we'll continue the panel. Uh, Ms. Norwood, would you like to thank you. proceed? And it's, it's very nice to speak after these young people. Tough act to follow, we, indeed. We, we really, they will make a better future, definitely. Right now, one million New Yorkers have diabetes, and one-third of adults have prediabetes. Yet there is absolutely no city plan for the control and prevention of diabetes. The situation, Mr. Chair, is unprecedented. We have never seen in the modern era an epidemic allowed to grow for decades without any coherent effort to stop it. It is a public disgrace in public health. We had one case of Ebola and the whole city was mobilized. We haven't mobilized for diabetes, even knowing that thousands who have diabetes will suffer terrible but avoidable complications like amputation, blindness, and dialysis, and that without intervention, 5% of pre-diabetics will develop diabetes every year. We sincerely thank you, Chairman Levine as sponsor, and the Council Health Committee for introducing legislation 1361. I was happy to just learn that the department supports this, but I will review it because it shows where we are at. It requires the New York City Department of Health to finally compile a comprehensive report and a plan to reduce the occurrence of diabetes-related health problems. Amazingly, this has never occurred before. The legislation also requires the city to track numbers of complications like amputation, blindness, and dialysis every six months, and also to report on the massive data on citywide A1C levels, a measure of blood sugar, that it already has in the diabetes registry. The importance of this is underscored by a just released study with intensive sampling that shows, in fact, the combined rate of both diagnosed and undiagnosed diabetes for adults in New York is 16 percent about one in six adults, not the 10 to 11 percent widely used. Similarly, with council oversight to assure full tracking through procedure codes and claims data, we can finally expect full understanding of the disastrous complications of diabetes. For one example, I expect the amputation rate will be almost double that now reported. Even as we understand the full toll and tragedy of diabetes, however, we need to equally understand that we can pull back. Progress is so possible. The Department of Health knows, as does everyone in this field, that very well proven education will slash the diabetes risk for people who have prediabetes, just as proven care education for those who already have diabetes slashes the terrible complications. We could bring this proven education to the most stricken communities almost overnight by training neighborhood residents themselves as peer leaders to provide proven care education. Yet the Department of Health refuses and refuses and refuses to fund such proven education. I will conclude by telling you about two peer leaders and educators at Health People. One has lost 100 pounds and taken her sugar level from near fatal to normal. But tragically, it was too late for her eyes and she is going blind. The other has terrible foot neuropathy and it is painful for her to walk. But barely able to see and hardly able to walk, they are out every day teaching good care to other diabetics because they will not permit these same things to happen to other people when it is clearly avoidable. Where is their health department? Where is their support from the health department? They don't pay for this. Thank you again, Chairman Levine and the Health Committee, for these very important hearings. I feel they are breakthrough on many levels and that they are starting to make us coherent, which what we haven't been. So I hope the entire council will support your efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norwood. And I, I assume, though you didn't explicitly say it, that you're in support of intro 1361, which would require yes. the Department of Health to yes. report on some of the factors that you That's mentioned. That's correct. Okay, wonderful. Minister, please. Thank you. Uh, Minister Levine. <laughs> <laughs> you just promoted me. <laughs> but thank you. That's all right. You're involved in a great evangelistic effort in this city. And, you know, New York, I just came with the, the governor and I uh, was speaking Nancy Pelosi that is being the number one state in this country that is going after the gun lobby, the gun 
you know, violent um, things, and we know that all the deaths from gun violence, all the deaths from narcotics, drugs, or whatever, cannot compete with the, with the drug, sugar. Sugar is addictive, and it's the, it's, the, it's the worst killer, not only in America, in the world. And what you're doing here is, should be commended, and I applaud you very much for this bill, these bills that I know that is going to, you know, bring uh, great, uh, I must say, benefits to the residents of New York City. In the Dinkins administration, we fought to, to get the, the entire city to get behind the smoking ban in public places, and it worked. The bill was passed, and today we see the benefits of the smoking. With this sugar uh, bills that you guys are offering, I am here for one purpose and one purpose only, is that as you, as you mentioned to the representative from the administration, that despite all the efforts that they, despite all the efforts that they put into the, the programs to prevent and to do this, where is diabetes going? Where's the incidence going? I've worked for 25 years with the American Diabetes Association to raise funds. Every year, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars for diabetes, pre not prevention, <coughs> research. And to this date, this incidence and prevalence is going way up. So what I would like for you to do is to back up these bills with the importance of funding community-based programs that would help to prevent what is happening. And the, the, the labeling laws, and the, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the, in, as you, you're saying, the people in the, the, the community that are suffering are the minorities. And I tell you, the minorities don't read labels. They don't. And so they will be affected greatly by that. The most important thing is to, is to use the church school-based preventive health centers in funding them to educate people like health people to get the peer leaders to reach out to the community and educate them about the dangers and to get them to, motiv to be motivated to want to change their lifestyle. And that's basically what I am here to testify about. Back up what you are putting in this bill with funding for prevention. Thank you for your passion and your focus on this important issue, Minister, and thank you for being here. I'm going to cue you in a moment, uh, Anna. I have to myself quickly run across the street to a press conference. Uh, in, their in, in the interim, you're in the capable hands of Councilmember Kalos, and I think we'll also be rejoined by Councilmember Barron. Um, I'll be back momentarily, but please um, take it away. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm also speaking in support of 1361. Um, my name is Anna Flato. I'm the Vice Chair for Clinical Services for Family and Social Medicine at Montefiore Medical Center, and I work in one of our federally qualified health centers in the Bronx. Many of my patients have diabetes, and I, like my colleagues, have seen too many people with life-altering complications such as kidney failure, vision loss, and amputation of their feet. As well as being a primary care doctor, I directed for eight years a wound healing program where we worked to ensure a high level of care for patients with diabetic foot ulcers to help them avoid amputation. It's unacceptable that in the Bronx, people lose their feet to diabetic amputation at twice the rate of patients in Manhattan. There are 306 regions called hospital referral regions in the country, and of those 306, the Bronx is number 17 for the highest amputation rate. This pattern is seen in poor neighborhoods and other boroughs in the city as well. Social injustice underlies these results. We all know that it is hard to eat healthy when you are poor, that some neighborhoods lack options for healthy food and exercise, and that many communities have inadequate access to primary care. It is also just hard to take care of your health if you are working two or even three jobs just to keep a roof over your head. The amputation rates tell us that once people have diabetes, we are failing them still further. Diabetic foot ulcers occur because high sugar levels damage the nerves in the feet so that a person can't feel a sharp object or an ill-fitting shoe that is causing a wound. The nerve damage also impairs the person's immune response so that infections can quickly become limb and life-threatening. 
Limb loss is devastating to individuals and to their families, and it increases the already high burden of disability in these communities. People with diabetic nerve damage, in partnership with healthcare providers, can substantially lower their risk of amputation if they are able to prevent ulcers and to quickly access high quality treatment when ulcers do occur. Our communities need programs that reduce the rate of amputations for people for di with diabetes, and we know from the evidence that there are several types of programs that can achieve this. Successful programs engage communities, educate patients, support preventive foot care services through primary care and podiatry, and provide expedited access to high quality ulcer treatment when needed. These initiatives enhance quality of care for individuals, improve population health outcomes, and save health care costs by avoiding hospitalizations. However, our highest risk communities currently lack coordinated efforts to reduce amputation rates for their residents. Can we implement these solutions in New York? In my view, we have no other choice because the alternative is to allow the crisis of diabetic amputations to continue unchecked. The close tracking of amputation data as proposed in this legislation is a necessary foundation for us to start coordinating efforts to actually reduce the diabetic amputation rate in poor neighborhoods. These solutions will require hard work, but they are possible with the partnership of the healthcare sector, government, and our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a uh, first question for uh, Teens for Food Justice. How are you? Good. How was the four train ride this morning? <laughs> Afternoon. Long. It was like an hour still. Yeah. I, I went. I went to. I went to high school on the, around the block from you. On. On 205th Street. Newman or. So across from. So we share your football field, Bronx Science. Oh, Bronx Science. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I think. Do you still? Do you? Do you ever? So what do you call it? Uh, so tell me about this hydroponic farm that you mentioned in your testimony and, and mm -hmm. what you have at your cafeteria. Do, so do both of you work at this farm? Well... In New York City? There's a farm in New York City in the Bronx. <laughs> tell yeah. them Well, for the farm, we have a hydroponics farm upstairs in our school. That's Teen for Food Justice. You can see it right here on my shirt. Yeah. Um, so we do supply like vegetables um, for for the cafeteria sometimes, fresh vegetables when they're fully grown. Sometimes we give it away like to parents. And, like, and you grow um, it yourself. Yes, we grow it um, wow. ourselves. And what kind of food choices do you have in your uh, in your high school? So. Uh, uh, we had DOHMH here. They were talking about the fact that they said that the school meals are healthier. Uh, to tell you the truth, yes, the school meals are healthy, even though I noticed that some, some of the meals aren't healthy because some of the meals, like the Friday food, I noticed that they give us like it on Monday after we had it on Friday. So. We have to wait a while before, like, fresh food come back in the cafeteria. Do we still have somebody in the audience from DOHMH? I don't know what that about. <laughs> no, no, sorry. So we're going to take what you just said. We're going to pass that along to DOA and DOHMH. There's somebody behind there. There's someone behind there. Okay. And so do you have vending machines at the high school? Oh, yes. We have vending machines. What's in the vending machines? It, uh, we, it have snacks. And you have sparkling water, and you have iced tea. It doesn't okay. really have that um, juice or sugary juice, okay. but the iced tea, I could say that's sugary juice. Does it have like uh, a, a uh, Gatorade or or Powerade? Um, no, I don't think so. And no carbonated beverages that are like Coca Cola or Pepsi or stuff like that. No. Um, it don't. It doesn't have any of that. That's really good to hear. And then like snacks, but do they have like M and M's or and Snickers or is yes, it like? Yes, they have a lot of those. Okay. And they teach some teachers yeah. um, bringing sodas and stuff. So sometimes we do have okay. sodas and stuff in the school, and, but and it's only on okay. occasions we get those. And then. Uh, Joshua, I don't know if you participated, but you mentioned that you did a survey 
can you tell uh, tell me about some of the restaurants? Or I maybe Miguel did this. Did either of you do this? You did the survey. Yeah. No worries. Okay. Oh, uh, I did it. So, can you tell me a little bit about the survey? What kind of restaurants did you go to? Was it chains or does it let local folks? They have kids menus and what kind of things did you see how how did you do the survey well it was a rest when i heard that we was going out on a restaurant i was happy everyone in team for food justice i thought we was going out to eat then i found <laughs> out that found out that the restaurant is actually nearby our school so i was like wow i never noticed it before and it's like i don't know you said that you used to go around the school area. I don't if I was making bad choices, there was Cozy Corner. You went over the bridge and over the train tracks, and then you well, went two under, more blocks. Well, like and there was a pizza place train, right under the train, under, yeah. Under the train tracks. I don't remember what's the name of the restaurant underneath there, but we went inside there, and it's a nice, cozy restaurant, you could say, but it had a lot of... Let's see what will young people love to eat. No he hardly healthy options. Um, for beverages, um, it's pure sugary drinks. And so there was hardly any like fruit drinks that is hardly no sugar base. And the only thing that we could see on the um, on in the restaurant that was healthy and no sugary base was like water. Got it. And uh, for those testifying on uh, 1631, uh, sorry, 1361, just forget the slight dyslexia. Uh, I, I, I hear your uh, request for funding. Some, so the, the question is, should the study that is being suggested be conclusive and, and prove your hypotheses and what your experience is at Montefiore, uh, how much needs to be set aside in the budget to actually provide adequate treatment so that when folks are diagnosed with diabetes that they actually are able to treat the disease effectively without any, uh, without it getting worse, without having to get to the place of amputation. So I guess uh, I appreciate the, the good reverend asking for, for the funding. The question is how much? So um, I'll just lead into by saying that I think the health services are, are already reimbursed and that's not really the issue. It's really the community initiatives that require funding. Right. Well, we, we, as was mentioned here, the, uh, the CDC has a, a diabetes prevention program that can prevent most of these things from happening that has a 60% success rate in preventing people becoming diabetics and also, you know, preventing amputations and different things because of the education. Because of the, the fact that we believe that the church has a major role to play in the change of anything in this country, anything that was changed, whether it's civil rights or whatever, church has a major part. So we believe that the church-based and school-based preventive health centers are areas where we can uh, not only motivate but empower people to make change in lifestyle and also follow the, 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 di the diet um, habits that would do the prevention. So we were asking if we can get a three, all we need is $3 million and we can do this for you. By 2020, we have a vision that is to reduce the incidence and prevalence of diabetes by 20% by the year 2020, using the church-based preventive health centers initiative. That's nine months. <laughs> yes, and the, the, end, the end of 2020. Okay, wow. So that's. Um, if yeah. somebody can provide a microphone and oh, you'll sorry. get the last yeah. word. Okay. Um, I think it's a question of building up around the city because you can train peer ed educators first throughout um, the highest risk areas of the city. There is mammoth literature uh, showing of what this kind of education saves in the end. Uh, I'll give an example. Dialysis now costs about $77,000 a year. 
it costs about $850 uh, to give someone a self-care course of six sessions, which brings down their dialysis risk by about 90%. Foot care, an amputation, but Dr. Flateau can give figures. It's not just the amputations, which it's, if, it's, if it's an above the knee amputation can cost up to 150,000. It's the ulcers people are constantly getting. Uh, those cost about 38,000 for an ulcer hospitalization. Targeted foot care education costs about $300 per person when you um, target it to diabetics who already have neuropathy who are, are the high risk group. So I think we would be happy to, you know, present a, a different ways of doing this and, and what it would cost and what you would get out of it. Um, we can do that before the Department of Health finishes its report because there is already, as I say, mammoth literature and mammoth in the field, which was not supported by the Department of Health. Unfortunately, what's, and I think it's important to know what makes this m more crucial is a lot of this education is occurring now through DISRIP, you may know, all right, that's over next year. All that's making progress is going to collapse next year. Thank you for the call to action. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to, uh, to mention that I, I applaud the Department of Health uh, through the uh, Borough of Brooklyn Interfaith Advisory Group uh, that Dr. Bassett has established, whereby we reach out to the, to the community in areas of the healthy bodega, and you talk about the, the food box that they're giving out. Uh, but as I said, they are the ones that are saying that they need from the council the funding to fund these programs that they do not have. You know, as I, I mentioned to Dr. Bassett the last before she, she retired uh, with a, on a town hall with the mayor, you know, where is the action in terms of educating, getting these peer leaders and getting these lifestyle coaches to actually go out in the community to influence the bodegas in there to do it? There's no funding. You, you were given a million dollars to put in the last budget for diabetes prevention, but it never went in. I don't know why the speaker didn't put it in. So I would hope that Dr. Kalos would be influential in leaving this place to make sure that with, with uh, my sister, uh, Dr. Barron, Dr. Danny, is to really make sure that there is funding for prevention of diabetes for community-based organizations. I, I will just, just to be clear, I don't have the MD or PhD, so <laughs> thank you. I, I, I do have a doctor of law. However, I'm told I can't say I'm a doctor, and I'm the black sheep of the family. My father was a doctor. My mother was a doctor. That's politically Not incorrect, a, black sheep. Please, my colleagues. You're correct. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies. I, I am. Uh, thank you. You got it. Uh, thank you to this panel. Uh, thank you to uh, Miguel and uh, Josh uh, for your great testimony and all the great work that you do. Our next panel is uh, Dr. Pascal uh, Rumo for NYU Langone Health and NYU School of Medicine. Uh, assistant Professor Jennifer Pomeranz uh, for the College of Global Public Health at NYU, Vanessa Salcido, Union Community Health Center, and uh, Melissa Olson. Uh, Community Health Care Network, all come on up. You two were called first, so I, yeah. I thought you looked familiar. I don't know. Uh, the name, just the name. No, NYU. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're, I, I didn't recognize her. I'm at the her. College of Global Public Health. Where, you're at Langone? Yeah, I work with Marie Bragg and oh, that's Brian Noble. Yeah. yeah, okay. So you have friends with them. So this invitation was technically for Marie, but. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, of course. She's had a baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Pasquale Rumo. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, your friends not, or your colleagues not coming up here? Okay. Mm -hmm.
the longest two minutes. Thank you to my colleague Inez Barron as we discuss uh, linguistics and inherent uh, prejudice in, in existing phrases and uh, always endeavoring to do better. Uh, if the panel, uh, whoever would like to go first, please do. Uh, if you have testimony, please hand it to the sergeant at arms and share your Twitter names. Okay. Um, well, I don't have a Twitter name uh, or Twitter. Uh, but thank you, first of all, for inviting me to testify at today's hearing. My name is Dr. Pasquale Rumo, and I'm an assistant professor at NYU School of Medicine. I apologize in advance for my scratchy throat. I'm battling a little bit of a, a cold. Um, the focus of my research is on improving the food and food environment, uh, especially for high-risk groups like children, and using strategies and studying strategies related to behavioral health economics to improve the food environment. And I'd like to share my findings related to the proposed bill and highlight those. Uh, I'll skip over the stuff about the statistics and everything that everybody else has said so far. But starting with the food environment, including the location of food resources, it plays a very important role in shaping obesity risk among children. For example, my colleagues and I at NYU have shown that public school children in New York City have enormous access to food outlets, including both fast food restaurants and full service restaurants. And we also have a publication under review showing that obesity rates are higher among children living very near to fast food restaurants in the city. And this relationship might be driven by the nutritional quality of fast food meals. So foods sold in fast food restaurants are often low in fiber and high in sodium, unhealthy fats, and refined carbohydrates. In particular, soda intake is significantly higher on days that children eat at fast food restaurants, as well as sit-down restaurants. And children who eat fast food consume more calories, added sugars, and sugary beverages per day than children who do not. And they also have lower consumption of milk. So such evidence, I think, demands a public policy response. Policies informed by behavioral economics, in particular, can promote healthier choices by nudging consumers in subtle, low-cost ways that, that honor individual preferences. For example, people have a, a preference for things to stay the same, so one way to leverage that preference is to change default options in your environment so that people are defaulted into healthy choices but can opt out of them if they, if they so desire. So the advantages of healthy default policies is that they are clear and practical and cost-effective, and healthy default options are also appealing because they are not burdensome for the consumer and they don't require a knowledge of complicated nutrition information. So, for example, default options have been shown to increase orders of healthy foods in restaurants with healthy default side options on menus such as salad instead of fries. So, uh, in summation, I think the proposed policy has the potential to reduce soda consumption among children and it has my full support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pomerantz. I'm um, here to testify on uh, 1064. So I thank you for your um, advocacy for public health, and I share the council members' commitment to public health and also fury about added sugar. But I really need to urge you, and I guess I'm going to be the one to point out the elephant in the room or the sugary beverage on the bill, but I I'm, I'm really want to urge you, I think that the definition of healthy default beverage is not evidence-based and I'm actually surprised I'm the first one to bring this up today. It is not an evidence-based definition. Um, flavored milk is a sugary beverage. Um, the bill should include just plain unflavored unsweetened milk of any fat percentage actually. The science fully supports that and there should be an evaluation component especially on the juice part. So just to give you a few more points on, on the, my summary of my much longer testimony that you have in front of you. Um, flavored milk is contrary to American Heart Association recommendations. It's contrary to nutrition science. It is not reimbursable under WIC or CACFP for children under five, and this is because it is considered a sugary beverage and it's not based on nutrition science. Yet whole plain milk is completely healthy, and studies show that over time, children that actually drink whole milk gain less weight than children that drink low-fat milk. And so there is a lot of uh, wrong, um, outdated recommendations that we should be focusing on low-fat diets and, and non-fat dairy. But this is basically based on uh, theoretical considerations about isolated nutrients and not empirical evidence on the clinical effects of milk. 
And I really, the biggest point I want to make here is that both Burger King and Wendy's and other fast food restaurants are glad to voluntarily comply with this standard. And the American Beverage Association agrees with this standard. And why is this? It's because the um, research shows that if you have early adoption of sugary beverages and sweet drinks early in life, it increases preference for sweet drinks later in life. So they're basically building up their clientele right now on sugary, on sugary beverages, including chocolate milk. And you guys were all laughing about white milk and chocolate and vanilla milk, and this is a sugary beverage that's in your default of the bill. California's law does not include flavored or sweetened milk, and, Ca and Connecticut's bill that was just proposed last month does not include flavored or sweetened milk. And we're New York City, and we were like the leaders of public health, and we should keep stay being the leaders. And I think you are totally committed to this and being a leader in public health. And in order to make that commitment a true one, we have to take the sugary beverage out of the default beverage option. Um, and the last thing is that the Beverage Association uh, often says that that it should be included because it's in school meals. And we all know that sugary that flavored milk is included in school meals, but this is because it's a USDA pro run program and the USDA's entire goal is to promote our agricultural supply in, in, in the food supply and dairy, increasing dairy consumption is actually a goal of our school food programs. Increasing dairy consumption is not a goal for the, the default beverage. And the other thing is actually school food studies show that, that we should be taking out chocolate milk and even New York City's own Healthy School Initiative suggests taking chocolate out of milk out of schools. So, I, and I just really want to point out the irony that we've been talking about added sugar and diabetes the entire time we've been here and no one's recognizing that the sugary beverage is still in the bill. So I urge you to please take, to amend that definition and I would have the full support of me and I think other people that have testified and would have liked to have said what I said but probably couldn't. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Dr. Vanessa Salcedo and I'm a pediatrician and director of health promotion of Union Community Health Center in the Bronx. And I'm also the co-chair of the Bronx Healthy Beverage Zone Project. As a pediatrician, I, help, I see childhood obesity on a daily basis. But I don't only worry about the obesity, I'm seeing the consequences of obesity. So let me quickly tell you about one of my patients. He's a 10-year-old boy who suffers from obesity and doesn't drink any water. All he drinks are sugary beverages such as sweetened teas, sodas, and sports drinks. I did a full workup and I f quickly found that he has fatty liver disease. And for fatty li liver disease, I have to send him for a liver biopsy. And this is something we don't really talk about. Unfortunately, there's more growing evidence that sugary beverage are contributing to the silent epidemic of liver disease. GI specialists know that uh, the future of fatty liver disease is causing, will, excuse me, GI specialists note that in the near future, fatty liver disease will be the number one cause of liver transplant in this country. So I quickly advise my patient to stop drinking all sugary beverages. To my surprise, he did. He started drinking water and seltzer, and after three months, I saw his liver enzymes improving. I couldn't believe it myself. These stories are becoming too familiar, and our families are suffering from these preventable diseases, such that we've talked about today, such as diabetes, liver disease, and we haven't mentioned the chronic ill diseases of severe tooth decay that our kids are experiencing. And their evidence is clear that these are contributing chronic diseases because of sugary beverages. Uh, and this is why my patients and, my, and I, our community are a driving force of the Healthy Beverage Zone, also known as HBZ, which is this grassroots cross sector co collaboration that's focusing on promoting healthy beverages throughout the Bronx for everyone who lives and works in the Bronx. So HBZ has been going on since April 2017 and we've gotten great momentum. We have 63 partners and these include churches, schools, 
health centers, hospitals, community-based organizations that have committed to remove sugary beverages from their vending machines, meetings, providing more waters, and we're educating the employees. Similarly, like what the students were saying, if the teachers are bringing in the sugary beverages, what example are they setting? And does it really matter if they don't have it in the vending machine? They're leading by the wrong example. So um, we're educating the employees and we're asking them to take a pledge not to drink sugary beverages and be a role model. We know that focusing on this small change will lead to a big impact in the health of the community and we're gaining momentum. Now the next step is removing the sugary beverages for the kids meals. We need to set that example. So thank you for the opportunity and I fully support Bill 1064 and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson Levine and members of the Committee on Health for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Melissa Olson. I'm the Director of Nutrition and Wellness at Community Healthcare Network, CHN. We're a network of 14 federally qualified health centers, including two school-based health centers and a fleet of medical mobile vans. We provide affordable primary care, behavioral health, dental, and supportive services to 85,000 underserved New Yorkers annually throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. As part of our mission to treat the whole patient, CHN offers a range of nutrition-related services to support healthy choices around eating and chronic disease management. We offer nutrition services at all 14 sites, including diabetes management and pediatric nutrition services, too. CHN also participates in the city's Health Box program and the Corbin Hill Food Project, which brings affordable vegetable boxes to our Crown Heights and Williamsburg Health Centers on a weekly basis during the summer and fall months. In addition to these programs, our nutrition team frequently offers in-person cooking demos and hosts walking tours at local farmers markets. Beyond direct service, CHN regularly advocates on behalf of its patients to promote greater accessibility and equity throughout the New York City food system. These include efforts supporting consumer education and choice and data-driven interventions addressing patterns of nutrition-related disease. The proposed legislation at today's hearing addresses salient factors contributing to growing rates of childhood obesity, diabetes, and diabetes-related illness throughout New York City. CHN strongly supports intros 1064, 1326, 5 and 1361 with the following considerations. For intro 1064, which proposes switching the de default beverage in children's meals to one of three healthy options. It addresses a significant challenge in maintaining a healthy lifestyle for both children and adults. Research shows that children's dietary habits set the trajectory for their nutritional choices throughout the rest of their adult life. Children who assume healthier eating habits at a young age are more likely to maintain better dietary habits as they grow older. However, the prevalence of unhealthy food options oriented towards school-aged children, as well as heavy, heavy marketing associated with these products, makes it challenging for young people to start off on the right foot. Additionally, children living in neighborhoods with limited access to affordable, healthy options are even more likely to have early exposure to unhealthy food and beverage options. We believe Intro 1064 will facilitate healthier consumption habits by making healthy beverages the default option for children's meals without eliminating the element of choice. I will add that I agree with my colleague about not including flavored milk in the definition of healthy options. In my family, chocolate milk is considered a dessert. It's not a beverage option. So with that amendment, um, we also ask the, con the committee to also consider whether this type of legislation could include venues used for children's birthday parties. Uh, these locations are another environment where children are often served high sugar beverages with preset meals as part of the party package. Councilmember Kalos, you will see this in a couple years as your baby <laughs> daughter makes the birthday party circuit. Um, so any legislation addressing these spaces, of course, would be limited to locations where meals are provided by the venue itself, but it would be nice to see water served with the pizza and cake instead of Hawaiian punch. I'm the awful parent who brings healthy food for the party. <laughs> The second bill, intro 1326, focuses on empowering the consumer to make healthy choices. While we support the intentions of this legislation, we encourage the committee to consider the possibility of information overload on an already crowded menu display, especially in food establishments already required to post calorie information. While the goal of this legislation is to help individuals make the healthy choice, it is also important that the information displayed is consumer friendly. 
One method that has been implemented in certain food establishments is the use of a healthy icon to indicate items, thank you, to indicate items that are the healthy choice. Of course, this method assumes a certain level of food literacy and would require establishments to define what a healthy food option means. So intro number five would complement nicely to show what a healthy food option means in a health literate and visual way. We certainly like the idea of crafting such a poster in partnership with the DOE and schools across New York City. Ultimately, CHN is supportive of intros 5 and 1326, but encourages the committee to consider additional ways to display nutrition information that makes it easy for the consumer to make the healthy choice, much in the same way intro 1064 makes the default drink option in children's meals the healthy choice. Finally, intro 1361 calls upon the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to investigate trends in and develop plans for mitigating diabetes and diabetes-related illness. CHN is fully supportive of this measure and encourages the analysis to account for disparities related to race, ethnicity, income, and geographic location. In a recent report, the Department of Health noted significant racial disparities in childhood obesity. These phenomena are strongly linked to other factors disproportionately affecting communities of color, including limited access to affordable healthy food. We encourage the city to take into account these factors when putting together a list of recommendations for implementation. We also recommend that the results of this study be incorporated into a public health campaign, encouraging New Yorkers to engage in regular primary care and to adopt healthy lifestyle habits as a means to improve diabetes-related statistics. CHN applauds the City Council for introducing legislation that would address high rates of obesity and diabetes throughout the city. We thank the chairperson and the committee again for the opportunity to speak today, and we hope to continue working with the city to address issues of food access, equity, and health. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a handful of questions. Uh, first, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pasquale uh, Romo. Is it Rum Rumo? Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me a little bit? There's a, a piece in here cited. Uh, I believe it is understanding bias and relationships between the food environment and diet quality of the coronary artery risk development in young adults. Uh, Cardia, which was published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health in 2017, and I believe you are the lead author. Is that correct? That's right. Can you tell me about how your, pers your first hand research on the matter informs your testimony on that and what the impact, what, what you found in your specific research? Right, so we looked at whether the availability of fast food restaurants and different types of food outlets affected uh, individuals, in this case adults, that study was about adults. Um, and their risk, uh, not their risk, sorry, their diet quality. And we found that those who had a greater availability of fast food restaurants and convenience stores around where they lived were more likely to have poorer diet quality, including lower consumption of uh, whole, um, whole grains and fruits and vegetables, as well as higher consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, in your testimony, you uh, mentioned uh, two uh, behavioral uh, economists, uh, Thaler and, and Cass Sunstein, of both of whom I've had the opportunity to collaborate with around uh, a project I'm working on called Ad uh, Automatic Benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, uh, uh, is this something where we should be bringing both of them to the table on this issue, or you're just referencing their work on Nudge, which is a book I actually very much enjoyed? Um, uh, he. <laughs> I actually asked him some personal questions about things he had cited as poor decisions in his book, uh, and he's actually since corrected. But uh, how would Thaler and Sunstein be involved in this, and uh, uh, should should we be inviting them to testify in the future? Uh, right. Yeah, I think, well, you should if you want to continue making uh, policies surrounding healthy default options, because I think those are um, very, uh, th they're shown to be effective strategies to nudge people to make healthier choices, but still allowing them to make other choices, uh, un less healthy choices if they so desire. So that's, I was citing it in the context of supporting the fact that you're using healthy defaults here versus providing more nutrition information that might overburden the consumer. Great. Uh, for Dr. Uh, Pomerantz, and it, I'm, I'm a doctor like you're a doctor. <laughs> uh, you're, 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 oh, you're a JDMP, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, so Counselor Pomerantz, yeah. uh, fair, fair enough. <laughs> uh, so I, I really appreciate your coming and uh, speaking out honestly about your concerns about including uh, flavored milk. Uh, I think one of the questions that I always ask is, is it 
is it better to ha and I think you heard from the American Heart Association, which have been leaders on this. Now I know not for eight years, but for a decade. And we started with a very strong bill that included uh, restrictions around the calories in the meal and the source of, uh, and we've gotten to a bill that we believe we, and I think if you, not to, you can literally look at the testimony which you just heard, it's in the transcript, but this is legislation that we believe we can pass. So I guess the question is, is the flavored milk a, a deal breaker for you and such a deal breaker that it would be worth another three to ten years of the status quo or is it one of those things and I'm a software developer in addition to being a lawyer where uh, it's iterative and it would mean that we would set a new normal and yes the new normal would still include a, a milk beverage that is flavored but we would be taking soda and so many other beverages and, and sh sugar added. So I guess uh, that's the, the honest response. So a few thoughts. The first is that I, I still feel that New York City, we think of ourselves as a leader, and yet we're, we are falling behind California and Connecticut if we stick with this definition which is an embarrassment to us all. Um, but the truth is, I understand that perspective that the political feasibility may outweigh the evidence-based definition for some people. And if, But I would encourage you to then include an evaluation component, which specifically looks at what's happening with these default options. Um, and a lot of the research yeah, no, I mean, and a lot of the research in the schools show that what happened when they took out flavored milk, some milk consumption, there was a dip in plain milk consumption, but then it started to rise again once the students got used to it, just like what will happen in the restaurants in New York City. And P.S., we're not banning anything. They can fully ask for the flavored milk. Um, so I think that that is something to strive for. And uh, unfortunately, the country started bringing back chocolate milk when it really was seeing an increase in plain milk. And interestingly enough, the 100% juice, when they offer 100% juice, that's when the plain the milk started to drip, drop more. So there's a lot of... Um, interactions among the beverages that you're offering. So you really need to evaluate your current definition if you implement it or any other revised definition and then see if, you know, I would hope that you guys have the courage to revise the definition if it turns out that, you you know, this is this the ev non-evidence-based definition didn't work as you had hoped. My, my recommend is you've, you've got somebody who is ready, ready and willing. I think it is a matter of we have to negotiate the bills with the uh, administration. The good news is they'd like to cap it at 130 calories, which still doesn't sound like it'll be good enough. What I will say is I did a quick Google, and uh, in reference to the vanilla and chocolate milk that we were discussing, it, the, the brand is Horizon, and it is a, a milk that I drink at home that doesn't have that many calories when I drink it. So it is. Uh, it was a little bit surprising, and so I look forward. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Salcido, uh, thank you for all the tweets during the hearing. Uh, I, I did a quick Google of fatty liver disease, and uh, Dr. Google says that it's actually more prevalent as a symptom of folks who, who are, have, have issues with drinking. Uh, so I guess, how, is, that, is, that, is that accurate, and, and how often do you see fatty liver in, the, in a youth population versus an adult population? And that's kind of scary. Yes, so um, more and more evidence is showing that um, sugary beverages act similarly to alcohol on the liver. And that's the first step wow. to cirrhosis. Um, so this is becoming a huge epidemic. I am not a GI specialist. Um, especially because of the fructose is goes to the liver and increasing it, it increases the fat and then as it, as it continues as it continues it goes to cirrhosis and of course this is uh, takes decades to occur but if we don't stop that process and stop the obesity and stop the sugary beverage consumption um, this is a huge problem and um, talking about disparities, this is um, in California, they're looking into this uh, more and more, and unfortunately the Latino population have a genetic predisposition for this fatty liver disease. So it's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, and it's 
and it gets triggered by sugary beverages as well as alcohol. And that's uh, the, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, NAFLD? Mm-hmm. Okay. That, I, I'm learning more, and I guess just to, uh, la la last question to Melissa Olson. Uh, so yes, I, I now get to spend my weekends uh, at birthday parties, mm -hmm. and so I guess I would be, does your organization have capacity to investigate? Uh, this, this legislation would apply to any place that has a letter grade, so you're, you're right, there are places that are serving food, and I imagine, I guess they're getting it catered, so. So it would apply to them as well. That's what I was hoping for. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, but I, if, if you have uh, capacity as part of the uh, Bronx Healthy Beverage Zone uh, and what you're doing to even just do a quick survey and whether you're welcome in my district, uh, you're welcome to come to the places that, that my daughter plays or, or where have you because I'm, I'm eager and interested and I think it's just a matter of figuring out exactly what the universe looks like. Would you be open to that? Um, healthy Beverage Zone was through with them, but uh, I think that we would be open to looking at what's in our surrounding communities for our clinics as well. I also would imagine that anything that's happening for the letter grade establishments, it'll have a ripple effect to the other establishments as well. Even if they're not serving food on site, uh, they, would, they would start to comply as well. But and, we could certainly look into that. And I would just say, I think I did something wrong because for her first birthday we offered our daughter like the, for the first time like a piece of cake and oh, no, she no. like well no she right. spat it out and then when she went straight to the fruits and vegetables that we had for her so, oh. so then you take it no worries okay thank you panel we have one final panel I will call up now uh, Matt Greller from NATO not the one that Trump hates <laughs> and Pamela Barney from the Tried and True Nutrition, Inc. And finally, Clarissa Alayetto, representing herself. And uh, if you'd like to, great. Thank you. Um, if you'd like to kick us off, Matt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Matt Greller. I'm an attorney and lobbyist here on behalf of one of my clients, NATO, the theater owners of New York State. And as you alluded to, this is not the NATO that defends Europe. Okay. We are the ones more concerned about the Oscars last night. It's a not-for-profit trade association representing movie theaters. In New York City, uh, NATO represents 37 theaters, 312 screens, and 1,800 employees across the five boroughs. Despite the very well-intentioned reasons behind both Introduction 1326 and Introduction 5, NATO opposes both bills because we think that they will only add confusion and not positively impact public health. Additionally, we question whether the signage or the warning label will truly help the fight against a complex problem like obesity. The average New Yorker only goes to the, movie four, uh, the movies four times a year and orders concessions just twice. During those two purchases a year, that person is looking for an enjoyable night out and perhaps a treat. Most of our candy comes prepackaged with labels that include the amount of sugar, and we do not think that any movie patron is surprised that our candy contains sugar. Yes, there are some foods out there that have surprising levels of sugar, but do obviously sugary foods really need a sugar warning icon? Is the movie theater the right forum for the government to alert patrons about too much sugar? Maybe the problem of obesity is too complex and more warning icons or posters are not the best one-size-fits-all approach for all foods or for all food service establishments. Instead, we suggest the following, more advertising, more collaboration, and more education. Why not seek state funding for nutrition awareness ads with basic information? The theaters would be happy to run them. Do people understand what a calorie is or what the recommended daily allowance of 2,000 calories are? Do people know what is meant by 12 grams of added sugar? Do people understand the AHA's suggested sugar intake for men, 150 calories versus the 100 calories for women? Why not advertise this information? We think that more contacts can have a greater impact. We also ask the council to collaborate with the food industry on messaging. Many in the industry are already voluntarily reducing sodium and sugar, and we could partner on a task force to elevate nationwide best practices. 
So instead of looking to add yet another warning label or an additional poster, we suggest amending language that is already mandated by the FDA with insertions. That language is 2,000 calories a day is used for general nutrition advice, but calorie needs vary. Additional nutrition information available upon request. We suggest adding the words, with calories from added sugars not exceeding 100 per day for women and 150 per day for men, and the words end allergen after addition nutrition. These changes would alert patrons, patrons to ask about allergens, they would educate the public about how much sugar they should be eating, and they would easily allow customers to find out about all other ingredients. Instead of a sugar warning label today and potentially separate warning labels for each other individual ingredient, why not do it all at once with just one sign that is already mandated? This will help food service establishments with certainty and prevents cluttering the very limited space on menu boards. As part of this effort, we could easily provide the full nutrition information for every single menu item, either through a QR code, online, on an app, or even with a laminated sheet of paper available at the register. We think this would also provide readily usable, understandable, and actionable information for all customers. Also, with over 10% of the population having a food allergy, we think the City Council could lead in this field. Therefore, we, we respectfully urge the Council to forego the single ingredient warning label or the single ingredient poster. Again, we suggest a comprehensive approach combined with more advertising, more collaboration, and more education. This will help all New Yorkers know about all ingredients, allergens, and nutrition with just one sign that is already mandated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt. Could you just clarify, are your theaters subject to the letter grade system currently? Yes, they are considered a food service establishment. Okay. Uh, our intention is actually not to add labeling requirements onto packaged foods uh, that already have nutrition labeling. It seems like the kind of thing that could be fixed in the bill. And uh, though I understand it's not explicitly addressed in the bill, as I said earlier in the hearing, I, I don't think we need labeling on the kind of foods which are obviously high in sugar, desserts and sweets and et cetera. Um, and uh, there may be no items that you sell that are not already obviously sugary uh, in the way that a lot of the fast food establishments um, have foods that you would never expect have so much added sugar. So definitely look forward to continuing that conversation with you. Thank you very much. Okay, please. Hi, I'm Pam Bonney. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and co-founder of Tried and True Nutrition. Um, I'm also a member of the American Heart Association Advocacy Committee in New York City. My Twitter handle <laughs> is at TNT Nutrition. Members of the Committee on Health, over the past 30 years, Americans have steadily consumed more and more added sugars in their diets, which has contributed to the epidemic of living at an unhealthy weight. According to the 2018 Heart Disease and Stroke Statistics, the prevalence of obesity among adults estimating, estimated using NHANES data increased from 2000 through 2014 from 30.5% to 37.7%. Our country has grown accustomed to an excessive diet high in calories and other nutritional concerns. And it's unfortunately starting with our youth. The same report cited above also shows us that the prevalence of overweight and obesity among children and adolescents aged 2 to 19 years is 33.4%. We are setting our children up for a lifetime of weight-related challenges, most notably chronic illnesses such as diabetes, heart disease, stroke, some cancers, and many others. Reducing the amount of added sugars we eat cuts calories and can help improve heart health and control weight. Since 1997, I have been helping clients do just that, achieve their nutrition and fitness goals in my private practice as a registered dietitian nutritionist and as a pediatric nutritionist. My personal and professional experience has shown that the consumption of sugary drinks must be a top priority when counseling new patients, and science backs this up. Studies have found a significant link between sugary drink consumption and weight gain in children. One study found that for each additional 12-ounce soda children consumed each day, the odds of becoming obese increased by 60% during one and a half years of follow-up. 
Intro 1064 is a sensible proposal that supports parents who want to instill a healthy standard for the children's nutrition. By making the healthy drink options more accessible, we are establishing a new norm for our children. It's appropriate to think of sugary drinks as a rare treat, something that is unusual and not typical of a restaurant meal. Parents will still be given the option to choose these drinks, but will be more likely to choose the healthy versions as those will be the default on the menu. Giving parents choices, as opposed to allowing restaurants to continue making the decisions for us, is a responsible move. I applaud Council Member Kalos, Chair Levine, and Speaker Johnson for their leadership on this issue and look forward to its full passage into law. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll close out with our final testimony. Then I know that Councilmember Barron has some questions. Uh, Ms. Uh, Alayeto, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Clarissa Alayeto, and I'm here in support of Bill 1064A, uh, just representing myself. Uh, I grew up in the South Bronx, in the Mahaven community of the Bronx. And um, as many of us know, the Bronx is ranked as the unhealthiest county in New York State. Uh, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, I've not only seen the impact of sugar beverages, I've also experienced it in my life. I've lived it. Uh, my neighborhood is surrounded by fast food restaurants and bodegas, uh, making unhealthy options easily accessible and appealing to young people. On my way to work, on a train, on buses, in the parks, I see children, young as toddlers, with juices, even sodas that contain lots of sugar. At the age of 34, I was obese, weighing 283 pounds, and diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Most of my sugar intake came from juice and soda. After making the choice to only drink water for two years and cut out all sugar beverages from my diet, I'm no longer diabetic, and I've lost 100 pounds. This should not be the first option for our young people, because the long-term effect will be detrimental to their lives. The council today is considering a bill that will replace sugary drinks with healthier versions. This will make it more normal for kids to drink water and milk as opposed to juice and soda like I did. This should set the next generation on a path, on a healthier path, where sugary drinks are rare, okay, an occasional treat, and they pay more attention to what they're putting in their bodies. Good nutrition should be available to all New Yorkers. This law will help young people I see in my neighborhood live a healthier life, and hopefully it would help everyone in the South Bronx do the same. Thank you. What a inspiring note to conclude the hearing on. Thank you so much for coming and for speaking out. And Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and I congratulate you on, on your own personal uh, uh, success, but also turning that around to advocate for others in Mott Haven and, and around the city. And what you, what you say is so true. The calories that you take in and drinking don't really trigger the same kind of sensation in, in your body of being full the way eating food, food would. So we can drink and drink and drink with all kinds of sugar and we don't feel that we're filling up with calories even though we're packing them into our body. And so it's a particularly dangerous. Yeah. Um, and remarkable that just doing that one change to someone's diet, which is just cutting out the high sugar, high calorie drinks can be so transformative. So we congratulate you on that. And thank you for speaking out. Um, and I think that my colleague, Councilmember Barron, has a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you to the panel for coming and sharing your positions. And to the last panelist, congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Uh, that must have taken quite a commitment, but you realize the importance of that for your long-term health, so I commend you with that. You're a real model, and uh, that'll inspire me to drink less sugary beverages, you know. So again, I wanna really commend you, and I know your family is pleased with that. And to say that you no longer have diabetes is what we're trying to get people to understand what we're trying to get at people to understand. Thank you so much. And to the first panelist from Mr., I think your name is Mr. Geller? Keller? Greller, yes. Greller. Yep. <clears throat> oh, Greller. Uh, thank you for your testimony. And my question to you is, uh, 
people, I think you said people will be confused. So if we find a simple way of telling people not to have excessive calorie intake because calories turn to sugar in the blood, would that address your concern about people's sugar intake? It's a great question, Councilwoman. I, I think the real issue from the perspective of the movie theaters and the food service establishments in the city is space. I, I don't think anybody is opposed on the grounds of nutrition or the science. It's really what can you see and process in terms of the menu board? And there's a fear, and I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but that the menu board then becomes like a subway map. You have a lot of different icons or, or additional signs. It becomes information overload. If people want to go and order what they want to order. They should be informed at the point of purchase as to potentially what the healthier option is. But if so if we much, could get something like a skull and crossbone, <laughs> something simple and direct, would that be fine with you so that people will know, listen, you're making choices that are going to affect your life, so just be mindful. So, so I think it's disingenuous for this industry that, you know, thrives on people eating unhealthy things in the movie theater to really have us believe that you're concerned that it's complex. I, I wouldn't be here today uh, if, if that were true. Um, I'm also a parent, and I've worked in this industry for the better part of probably uh, 10 to 15 years now. Um, we are suggesting taking a sign that is already mandated by the federal government and tweaking it to provide more information specifically about sugar intake and additionally about allergens. Because the fear from the business perspective is there's a constant additional requirement or mandate and that becomes difficult for the businesses that do operate in New York, but are both national and international. And so they constantly have to update things, not just for the city of New York, but elsewhere. And what we're saying and advocating for today is to provide all the information, every ingredient, every uh, menu item, and all the information in terms of sugar, in terms of sodium, in terms of everything, so that customers can be informed. Uh, there just simply isn't enough space on the menu board. Most people have a phone, and even if they don't have a phone, they can get a paper menu, you know, with information. When, when we discussed this with Councilmember Levine, um, we, we gave him the information from some of the theaters just printed out. We can have that at the register. It's just too difficult to put it Well, we could a, simplify the menu and just offer water. I, I'm not discussing one particular menu item. I'm talking about the, the bigger picture. I'm talking about the big, you said crowding the menu board. Yeah. And I'm saying if we just offered water. So, so you think the city of New York should ban all drinks, milk, juice, uh, you know, sparkling, We're still, talking sodas, about everything. those beverages that have added sugar. Sure, sure. So talking about, as has the previous panel said, chocolate milk and sure. other uh, flavored I, beverages. Yes, but this extends to food service establishments regarding menu items which include food. My position is that this is a an economic position and the industry is not looking to have their resources and their benefits and their uh, income reduced. I think that the economics of the business is that they want to sell products and if mm -hmm. the customers are educated and have the availability of funds to purchase something that they will purchase something and whether it's a no calorie beverage full calorie beverage or you know a low sugar item if they're given the information at the point of sale they will vote with their wallets um, they are in the business of selling food they are in the business of selling beverages and I think that if we can collaborate and educate people on what is the best or healthiest option, everybody would benefit. The businesses would still be able to sell the items that they want to, and we would make sure that New Yorkers would have healthier um, health outcomes, like, like my co-panelist uh, here as well. You know, I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration on this. I don't think that um, people are so far apart on these issues. It's just a question of, again, and I, I don't mean to bur you know, constantly bring up this point, but it's, it's a really a question of space. The movie theater menu boards are quite small, um, and the counter space are quite small. So th there's not much room for information, but we already have a sign up. Why not use that sign and, and educate people about the amounts of sugar, and educate people also potentially about allergens, which has not been done in any jurisdiction in the country. I'm glad that you're concerned about allergens, but we want to really just sure, focus sure. on yeah. it. It's nice to uh, bolster your position by talking about the health concerns of allergens, and they're quite legitimate, but we're talking here about 
added sugar. Yeah, no, no, my, my point about the allergens is just that uh, there are a number of bills in the council that address that, and we think there should be one sign to cover everything. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. <clears throat> and I believe Council Member Kalis has a question as well. I was not expecting to ask questions about 1326 and introduction five, but your, your testimony just caught me so off guard. So just when you go to a, a movie theater, like there's bottled water, but in terms of other healthy options, can you cite some that you frequently see? Because like the nachos, not so healthy. Hot dogs, not so healthy. Uh, popcorn covered in butter, not so healthy. Like where's the, like as far as I under, so let me start with the first question. Sure, sure. Is it legal for me to smuggle water and healthy food into things like apples and fresh fruit and bananas and, and some of the things I may or may not currently smuggle into movie theaters? Is that legal? I, I think if you use the word smuggle, it might connote that it's not really acceptable. I don't know about the legality. Uh, there, it is frowned upon. The theaters obviously want to sell their products. They understand would, would, that it occurs. Would NATO and why support either? And so one of the things that was absent from this conversation is we have a fast food industry that over the years has actually started to become yes. healthier to meet us where we're actually getting to. Would NATO support saying, okay, we're going to set best practices and say we're going to have fresh fruits and vegetables and, and maybe instead of chips, we can have carrot chips and, and saying this is the standard and we want them available at every single movie theater? Those efforts have been made over the past decade and unfortunately um, what the, most of the chains have seen, and I've seen some of the data and I'd be happy to get specifics sure. for you. They've tried to sell bananas, oranges, apples, granola bars, mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately what occurs is they end up donating them or throwing them away because nobody buys them. And it's not as though people um, say, oh, should I get the popcorn, as you alluded to, with, with the butter versus the low-sugar, healthy granola bar or just the, the raw fruit. It's that people expect when they go to a theater, if they're only going once or twice a year to see maybe you know one or two of the films that might have been nominated for an Oscar, they're there for a night out, and it's not really having an overall impact uh, out of the rest of the 363 days out of the year. So there has been an effort made. There has even been an effort to steer people towards low-calorie and no-calorie beverages. Um, I, I think the data shows that people are uh, already choosing that in terms of their own decisions, and maybe a, a helpful nudge may help um, encourage better behavior as well, but, but the data show from the theaters in the city already that those healthy food items are, are not selling. Uh, I would say a decade ago, folks didn't go to a fast food restaurant for, for healthy food, and now that's starting to change. Y yes, there is absolute change. So let's change, change it. Yeah. Would, would, will you help us change it? I, I'm here today to collaborate with the council, and I think, think what we're suggesting... Would, would actually like. When you said it was small boards, like yeah. behind you is a LCD screen, and, and usually I see like five or six of them lined up on a, a very extensive display that has lots of uh, food uh, pictures on it. So I guess I just was not persuaded by that. I would just say that um, I, I would hope that uh, NATO and Y would be interested in supporting this legislation and what have you. Uh, I want to speak to the other two folks. I want to thank you for sitting through a, a long hearing and for your participation. Uh, for Clarissa, uh, can you talk to me about, um, about your struggle with uh, type 2 diabetes, about what your how your environment contributed to it, and how you became an advocate around this issue and what you hope to see and how this would have changed your life? Definitely. Um, I was diagnosed two years ago, and I, um, it was, diabetes was something that plagued my family for a really long time. I saw the effects uh, with my grandfather, amputations, uh, eventually uh, losing both his legs, his wow. sight, um, and, and eventually dying after, like, his organs began to shut down after having diabetes. Really and um, that, that kind of scared me a little bit. But in my environment, you know, I, I, I'm growing up in Mott Haven in what is the poorest congressional district in the country. And, you know, we don't really have healthy options. When you look outside, I, I grew up in 
public housing and NYCHA. And when you, you come outside, we're, we're surrounded by fried food, chicken spots, and McDonald's and Burger Kings and, and all of these fast food chains that seem appealing, right? Um, there, but there's nothing, to date, there's nothing healthy in the community. Uh, there's nowhere where you can go and f- buy fresh produce, right? We have to wait for the farmer's market to come around and it's seasonal. Um, so there's a, there's a struggle. There's a real struggle. And then there's also the struggle of not being able to afford certain foods, right? Like having the option of saying, well, should I buy a salad that costs 13 bucks or should I spend 13 bucks, you know, for more food uh, for something else? So I, I did struggle. I, I struggled for a while. After being diagnosed, I became a little depressed. I didn't know, you know, what to do, um, of course, because I had to now unlearn everything that I already learned about eating and what food really meant. Um, so I began to do a lot of research on my own about food and being diabetic and um, d- decided to, I, I had to kind of see where was this sugar coming from. And I realized I was drinking soda and, and, and juice uh, all the time. And so I decided to cut it all out and drink water. So now I only drink water um, and nothing, nothing else, just water. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Definitely. Thank you for Thank your you. support. Thank you to our final panel and to this great hearing today. We appreciate everyone who testified. This concludes the hearing. Thank you.